Welcome to TT Boy TV. It's been a long time, and I finally made my, way, made my way back. So today we have an incredible special guest. Beautiful, sexy, super cool, smart, and um, entrepreneur too. I know she is. So please welcome the superstar from the 80s, Amber Lynn. Yay! Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's hey. an honor to be here. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. So how, how have you been? Ben, I've been, it's like since when, since the yeah. 80s? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, take a seat. We got a lot to go over if you want to know how I've been out since that long. All right, I'm, all right. Well, let's start from the beginning then. Right. Okay? Okay. We're going to go way, way, way back. And how was your childhood? Well, my childhood was crazy, insane, painful, confusing. I grew up in Orange County. Um, come from a family of boys. My brother was, as you know, was in the industry, Buck Adams, and he was my oldest sibling. Um, and uh, oldest of four boys. And um, we got taken away when we were kids and put into a foster home. Ooh. I was three years old because my parents got a divorce. Um, they had had a daughter before me and she was born with a heart defect and passed away when she was two years old. So my mom was insane, obviously, as anybody would if your baby was dying, you know, since the day it was born. So it caused a lot of heartache in our family. Um, then I went into a foster home and I didn't see my mom or my brothers until I was about seven and a half years old. And I got out of the foster home and came home and about about a, within a year my mom and i were on the interstate highway coming back from the holidays and um my aunt's house and we were in a car accident got hit by a cement truck and it killed my mom what and the last thing that my mother did was grab me because I used to ride it was a falcon and you could stand up in the back of a falcon I used to ride in the back with my arms around my mom and she latched onto me by the scruff and threw me right out the window and then the cement truck mixer rolled over and it literally like crushed the top of the car and it killed her so the last thing my mother did was save my life but my brother buck who grew up as charlie um when my family came out to pick me up you know they were two different families and my dad i guess said come on we got to go pick up your sister your mom died in an accident there's been an accident and so um my dad when i you know when they brought me out of the car it almost it like completely scalped me. I was in a coma for several days what? in the hospital. What? And the first thing I saw was my brother, Charlie, who is Buck, you know? And he reached out and he picked me up and he was like, it's gonna be okay, don't worry. Nobody's gonna hurt you again. And so in that moment, I bonded to Buck. Like, you know, we were forever bonded as brother and sister. It was just at a different level where, you know, everything that would happen, like I could finish a thought for him, you know, we could finish each other's sentences. And we also fought and had disagreements and stuff, but um, it was crazy. So growing up, uh, my brother was like all these great things, you know, he was my hero, but he was like a race car driver at one point and he owned a formula car. Really? And, well, yeah, because there was a giant lawsuit because of the cement truck hitting my mom's car and the loss of it. And so we all had these massive trust funds growing up and my brother bought a race car and he became a boxer and he did like all these things. And one of the things that we were all into down in the OC, everybody's into, is muscle cars. So my family was a Chevy, Chevrolet, and we loved Camaros. And so we all had like Camaros. What, what year? Like mine was a 71. Oh, no. well, my well, older well, brother's was a 68. I had a 71. You did? Yeah. Oh, I love that car, right? I had the 71 Camaro. It was, first it was silver and black. 
You know, the ones with stripes? the racing stripes? Oh, nice one, yeah. Bought it like that. And then I was like, I want it. My uh, brothers were like, this is going to be a big, you know, they wanted me to have a bigger one. It was an SS. You had the Super right, Sport then, right? right? Yeah. yeah, the SS. And they were like, because I wanted a Camaro, and they were like, we want her to have the biggest Camaro because we don't want her to get killed, you know? Because after what happened with my mother, my dad was like, if anything fucking happens to your sister, I'll kill you all. Don't come home. So my brothers were always so protective of really? me. Wow. Oh, yeah. And I was very extroverted growing up. Let me tell you a secret about the, the Camaro real quick. Uh -huh. All right. I had a girlfriend. I was 16 when I had the car. I would take the back seat out, the back part of it, uh -huh. put the front seats, lay them forward, and I'd take that cushion Lay it there and make a bed and want to fuck her all day long, you know? You're kidding. <laughs> the 71 Camaro, right. I didn't know that. I knew that you could pop out the back, the back of it, though. Um, so my brothers, we, we lived out in Marietta for a while. My dad oh, took really? us out there. Oh. Yeah, he wanted to get the kids out of the city for a while. Didn't work out. So we're out in Marietta, and my brothers are like, drag racing they were in a club called the west orange street rods and so my brothers were racing cars and getting in trouble and getting arrested and all this stuff was going on my brothers were like one of them was a total loady my brother ducky he was like a total loady drug addict pothead crazy drug addict or just yeah, pothead just oh, everything everything, <laughs> everything <laughs> right. right my brothers used to have like keg street street parties you know block parties and log off log off the whole block and they all had muscle cars and all their friends had muscle cars so they must have got a lot of girls all the girls they all had all the good looking chicks right and and my brother buck was the really good looking one he looked like my dad so he was the handsome guy he got a lot of girls and most, they all did so i grew up in this kind of party atmosphere and um, it was just really wild. I was like eight to 10 years younger than my older brothers, and they were always trying to keep me out of trouble and keep me out of the way. And I was like, no way, you know? So I would sneak in their room and I would roll joints. No! <laughs> I, would, oh, oh. I would sneak in the room when I was like eight. I Whoa! Would eight, and I would take my brothers. You didn't like, smoke it. No, I would sell oh. it. Oh, shit. I was an entrepreneur. I knew it. And I, I was knew. young. I would take my brothers and I would break into his stash. You know, they'd take it and they'd put it in like um, jars and they'd try to hide it under the bed or hide it in the closet or hide it in holes in the walls and all this stuff. And I would go in and get it and I would open it and I would roll it. The first time I got in trouble in school, because I went to like elementary school and I was selling joints, but I was selling joints that I was making out of my brother's stems and seeds because I didn't know the difference. So I didn't get in trouble because it wasn't marijuana. It was like it was like stems and seeds. So, but they I got sent home from school for that, and they had to come. My my sixth grade or fifth grade? I was in like the fifth grade. Wow. I think I was in the fifth grade. So, and they're like, you need to come down to the school your daughter is selling marijuana out of the bathroom. And I was like, <laughs> I would sell joints out of the out of the bathroom and stuff and be like, got them for my brothers. So hmm. yeah. Buck was cool, you know. Yeah. You know, I, he came to my house right one time and they stayed for six months. I know you told me that. <laughs> so, that was the reason why I wanted to do your show too, because I so I so appreciate that you were good to my brother. You know, I know my brother had some crazy times in the industry. Uh, did he ever say anything about me? TT was cool? Yeah, right? all the time. Absolutely. Oh, there's one story. This guy was driving fast in a parking lot, right? I don't know if Buck told you the story. So the guy, um, <clears throat> I said, what are you doing, man? Because he's going to run people over in the back parking lot of these apartments on Reseda Boulevard. Uh -huh. I said, don't do it again. I'll fuck you up, right? <laughs> He goes, I'm 18, I'm 17 or something, right? I said, I'm young too, right? Probably like 22, right? right? And then the manager said, no, he's like 21. So I went and knocked on his door, pulled him out and knocked him out. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah. Like, boom, I beat him up. Funny. And then, you know, there was a problem after that. But Buck was like, I don't got to get out of here, right? Anyways. So Buck was always the one who was the stabilizer in our family. Even though he was wild, he wanted to keep the kids 
taken care of and I had two other brothers one was younger than me one was older than me and you know he was kind of like our dad because my dad passed away when we were 11 what but Buck um, started working at the Anaheim Stadium doing concerts he was doing security so when I was about maybe 11 years old I started going down to the Anaheim Stadium which was like blocks from our house where we lived and I would come in the back and he would let me in and go go to all these concerts so from the time <coughs> I was like 11 years old I went to every single concert at really? the Anaheim Stadium. Rock and roll, I right? I went to Alice Cooper, I went to Aerosmith, I went to I went to Black Sabbath, I went to my other brother took me to the last Led Zeppelin concert Whoa. that played in the USA. Yeah, I was like 13 what, years old. John Bonham there? Yeah. Whoa. All of I got to go and my and my family was really into music and rock and roll and they wanted me to be it musically mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and so um yeah I followed in my brother's footsteps and they were always really cool to me because they knew that I had lost my mother so my brother's mo Molly called over me you know and um, let me do all these things and my other brothers were like well, she gets to do everything and I'd be like yeah I'm going <laughs> for it who was the best oh out of my brother no no who was the best of those concerts oh out of all the concerts well to be honest with you um, I loved Ted Nugent when I was a kid. I was like, into Ted Nugent. He's on social media, right? Yeah. He's cool. I love him. You know he I mean? is so psycho now, though, right? <laughs> I know, but... I went to Cal Jam 2. I went to California Jam 2. We hitchhiked. Uh -huh. Okay, so my get to California Jam 2, me and my girlfriend, and we're like kids. We're like 13 or something. We're really young. And we push our way, because this is just the kind we were. My best friend Marlo the Master push our way all the way up to the second row of the California Jam. Unknown to me, my brother, Buck, is doing security in the backstage. All of a sudden, I'm on this guy's shoulders and I see Buck. You, Lenny, you, right now, get down. And I'm like, what? What? And I'm trying to act like I don't see him, right? He's like, that's my <laughs> fucking little sister. That's my kid sister. Remember how Buck used to always say, I don't know if he ever said this to you, but he'd say, that's my kid sister. I think I heard him say that. And he would say that to people in the industry because he'd go, hey, that's my kid sister, guys. You know, because people would be like, oh, your sister's this and that. And he would go, no, that's my kid sister. Don't forget it, you know, because he just was just very, very protective of me. Like, when you were growing up, were you a good student? I was a good student who dropped out of school. What, what, how old were you? Um, I went to, I dropped out of school. I was going to um, uh, Orange High School, and I wanted to go to Richland, which was the continuation school. So I dropped out of school to be able to get sent to Richland High School, which I did. And then... What, what age you said, 16? When, when I was, like, 15, 16 years old, Yeah. All right, so but you were a good student, but then you said, fuck it, huh? Well, then I dropped out, but then I went back later, and I got my GED, and I went back to school, and I got a real estate license. I did a lot of stuff, but I did that much later. Did you go to college? No. Okay. This is a crazy question, but not that crazy because I just want to know, but, you know, I didn't know that you were, both parents were lost. That's real tough. I lost my mom at four, car accident. Really? But um, <clears throat> did you go to church? When I was young? Um, I did. Yes, I did. Okay. How was that? Did it affect you at all? Did you think anything or you were too young and you didn't really? Well, my parents didn't agree on the kind of religion that they, you know, supported. Mm -hmm. So everything in my family was um, conflictive. It had a conflictive dynamic, okay. you know, when I was young. When I look at, you know, your body on the pictures to your body now, right, you look like you've always had a hard body. So I want to know, were you an athlete? Were you, were you a cheerleader? Did you just have natural, naturally good genetics when you were young, like in school and stuff? Um, my brother said our, fam our whole family has really naturally good genetics. But at the same time, when I was young, my brothers were years older than me, and Buck was a professional boxer. So I always wanted to hang out with them. And he would go to the gym and train and box, you know, and do that. So he's like, here, I'll take you to the gym. So I remember the first time 
walking into a Gold's gym in Orange County, and my brother was like, you know, down there. And he's like, this is how you work out. That was it. I started working out every day. Every day. And then in the 80s. With weights or boxing? With weights. Okay. With weights. And uh, he was a boxer. And then in the 80s, fitness was huge. And um, Jane Fonda. Not Jane Fonda. Uh, Corey Everson was like a big, you know, she was big. Mm, Corey Everson, yeah. Rachel McLish, mm. and all of those people. So I was like, we just got into fitness. And then I started doing hot body contests and bikini contests and going to the Orange County Speedway and doing like bikini shots with the race cars, you know, the muscle cars after the shows. And you would make money. You could carry around a camera and be like, 20 bucks a shot. At what age was this? And I was like in my teens. teens. You know, I was like 15, 16, oh, 17 cool. years old. You had a crazy body. Yeah, and I was always out to make money. So I was always <laughs> a little entrepreneur. I was I was like, we can make some money. Let's go get the money. Let's get the camera. Just get your bikini. And, you know, even when I was little, I had like a lemonade stand and stuff like that. I'd be like, my brother would be like, you can't charge five bucks for a cup of lemonade. I'd be, yeah, I can't watch. I'll, I'll make it work. Really? You know, it'd be like, it has to be 50 cents or a nickel or whatever. And I'd be <laughs> like, no, I'd always be trying to figure out how to make more money out of it. Really? Were you more inclined to make money than buck or are you similar? Well, I was the one, I was definitely somebody who was more money and financially oriented, okay. you know, Buck was a dreamer. Buck was the guy who was going to make a, build a race car, uh -huh. you know, or a rocket that would fly to the moon. He was going to do it in the garage. He'd be like, I'll build it right here out of some, you know, <laughs> really? spare parts and whatever. Yeah. He, oh, he was always like that. Was he good in school? I'm just curious. You know, I wasn't there when he was in school, so I can't answer that. He was so far ahead of me. I know, I know that Buck, I would watch him. And so he didn't always act like he was smart, but I seen him do a lot of smart things and he could figure things out. So he was intelligent. Yeah, very intelligent. One of my brothers is, <coughs> uh, is, was a genius mentality when he was a kid. So I know that Buck was, he was the one I always went to yeah. when I wanted to know something about anything. Like he, he knew a, a little about yeah. everything, right. you know, he, you could ask him about anything. He just didn't act like he was, you know, some, you know, Einstein. He just was quiet about it, I think. Buck was very, to me, I, you know, I, uh, not to you though. <laughs> to me, he always was like, you know. I know everything. Tell me what to do, okay. especially when it came to fitness or cars or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because this is an important question. When you were young, you know, were you into boys? You know, were you into girls? Were you sexually intrigued at a young age or was that at an older age? When I was really young, I was a tomboy and I wanted to fit in with the boys in my family. So I didn't act like feminine. I acted like I was tough. You know, I wanted to climb trees and ride my bike and like compete with my other brothers and be faster than them. So I don't feel that I was sexually at all really? because I was overprotected mm -hmm. by my brothers, you know, and they made sure nobody got near me. And then when I got older and I got into high school, I was like, yeah, I was into guys. I was, I was into guys. So what age do you think you started noticing guys? Um, probably in, like, junior high and high school. Yeah, yeah normal, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I noticed girls when they were, I don't know, six. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but guys, guys are like that. Yeah, right? Yeah. But you're, so you're pretty much a normal girl growing up, pretty much. Pretty normal, yeah. Pretty normal. Nothing crazy? But I was, a I, was a, I was kind of like a tough kid, and my brothers... We grew up in Orange County in the Barrio, so we had F Troop, and that's like a Mexican gang that lived, we lived alongside of. And they used to like form gang riots, and they would fight with my brother's, you know, car clubs. And when I was young, they sicked one of their sisters on me, and a group of them beat me up in a field coming home from school one day. And I got my ass kicked, They like a, a whole group of them. And so I came home and I was all beat up and my brother goes, what happened to you? 
And I told him, and he goes, that's it. He goes, if you ever let them beat your ass again, I'm going to beat your ass every time you come home with your ass kicked. So I was so, like, hurt and, like, crushed that my older brother had, like, looked down at me and had, I felt like he was, you know, disapproving of me. So me and my friend Marla LeMaster were walking to this to the store and all of a sudden this girl, her name was Carol Mendez, I remember her name, she came riding her bike across the crosswalk, right? And I go, there she is, there she is, boom, I dropped my stuff, I went running as fast as I could and jumped up and grabbed this girl right off her bike, drug her into the street and beat her ass. I was like, watch me, watch me, Marla, so that she could tell my brother that I had done, you know, I did it, I did it, I did it, you know, and I went home and I was like, I did it. And he goes, see, you never let anybody. That was cool. Take advantage of you. And she was part of the gang. And she was the little sister. So what ended up happening was, after they did that, my brothers put me in the front seat of his mini truck, one of their mini trucks. Lower, kind of? Lower, low rider mini truck put me in the front seat and they took mod off cocktails and put rags in them and we drove right down their street with me in it like you did this to my sister. Fuck you. And then they bombed them with mod off cocktails. What? And this was the kind of stuff really? yeah, that was going on Whoa. in our neighborhood. That's real. Yeah, we were, I was a kid. I was just a little kid. I was like, and I was all sitting there with my brothers going, yeah, yeah. It, it was it was crazy. It was a crazy upbringing. So Buck was for real. This that wasn't Buck. That was Ducky. They oh, okay. did that with the mod off cocktails. But then it was Buck that said to me because he was a boxer. So he started making me train. And Boxing. He, yeah, and he would train my other brother, my older brother Mark, and he would say either you fight me and spar with me, or I'm going to beat your ass. And he would sit there and teach us to spar. And we had to know how because he said, I don't want you to not be able to take care of yourself in the street. You know, you're oh. going to get killed in the street if you don't. And that was sort of where we were from. So that's why I kind of have that attitude where when people mess with me, even now today, if I'm on the street and somebody comes up like they're checking out my dog or my purse, like, hey, what kind of dog is that? I'm a kind of dog that's going to get you killed. <laughs> And when you <laughs> when you come off like that uh -huh. with street people, they just look at you and go, "Whoa, okay, bye." <laughs> you know, if they're if they're out to like jump you or something, uh -huh. have you ever noticed that that if you act like, you know, like my purse or whatever? No, I don't. I don't. I just walk with my. You know, there was a cop that said to me. Um, in our neighborhood, he said, "You know, there's a lot of people getting gunpoint robbed now." for their purses. He said, yeah, don't get yourself killed over your fake Gucci bag. I said, first of all, I don't carry fake Gucci. A cop said that? <laughs> yeah, because they said, you know, because in, in um, West Hollywood, now they're having all these robberies. People are getting robbed right and left. And shot sometimes, right? They, and they don't even, they don't, they just walk up and shoot you. They don't even, like we were talking about earlier, it's not like they come up and rob you. Cowards. Or say, hold up, hold up your, you know, this is a stick up. They just walk up and shoot you and take it. So you have to be ready at any moment. So, yeah. Did Buck get in a lot of fights? Um, did Buck get in a lot of fights? Well, I wasn't there for a lot of them. But he became a professional boxer and then he had his hands registered for a while, and uh -huh. he got into a lot of trouble getting in fights. <laughs> well, I love the fights, right? So it seems, you know, like, because Buck had a, a good look. He was in really good shape back in the day, right? Right. I saw him pretty shredded. So he looked pretty strong, pretty rough, pretty tough, right? Right. So, you know, I, you know anyways, you know, we we hung out a lot, right? You know, for yeah. six months straight, right? Anyway, so that's exciting because I like to hear the fight stories, you know? Anyways, so... um. Of course, this is a porno-based type of interview, right? But it's right. about everything. So when was the first time you touched yourself, you know? When I was a kid, uh, when I was younger. God, I don't remember. Um, I didn't have a lot of sexual experience prior to getting into the adult industry. 
like I said, my family was very protective of me, and I was in a house full of boys, so it wasn't like I would be in my bedroom playing with myself, you know, my brothers would <laughs> oh, be, shit, like, really? walking through the, you know, hey, you know, what's going on, you know, let's go play football, or let's go, you know, smoke pot on the back patio, or what is my sister doing in her room? You know, they, we mm -hmm. didn't have that kind of quiet or mm -hmm. privacy in our household where that would have been possible. Um, as I started to get older, I guess so. Not so much until I got into the adult business did I feel free to explore my body. You well, know, really? put, put wow. it that way. Like, I didn't feel comfortable about, like, masturbating or doing things like that. Once I got into the adult business, I learned so much because remember, I didn't have a mom. I didn't have a dad. I was raised by my, Incredible. by my dad. I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry. Yeah. My, my dad's, my stepmom, who was my dad's wife and she was an alcoholic. And so she wasn't engaged with us. But when I got into the adult industry, that's why I loved it because uh -huh. all of a sudden I learned about everything, you know, and one of the first people I met was girls like Erica Boyer, Nina Hartley, who was like way out there sexually free, you know, and I was like, wow, what, you know, what have I been missing this whole time? Um, <clears throat> this is a question, right, that, um, you know, guys want to know, right? Did you have a wet, <laughs> wet, wet <laughs> pussy? You know, just straight out there with the pussy. Cause I, you know, we, we never worked together, but you know. So yeah. So sometimes you get excited; it's more wet. But some girls are super wet. I'm just asking. Um, me, I'm always wet. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always <laughs> wet. I always have this joke that I make because it's really? like squishy. Uh. It'll get. Oh, oh, yeah. I've never had a problem sexually with wetness, and I've never had a problem with multiple orgasms. Wow. Yeah. So, like I said, I and I and I attribute it to the fact that I wasn't preconditioned as a child to not like or feel good about my body, exploring my body. I just had never done it. So once I got into the adult business, and you know, we're talking about the '80s when it was like. Jamie Gillis, John Leslie, you know, Nina Hartley, Ginger Lynn. Ginger Lynn was like the first girl I had sex with. She molested me. Hold on yeah. a second. We gotta wait. <laughs> <laughs> but it, all right, go ahead. But it was free. You know yeah. what I mean? The free spirited sexuality where it was like, wow, experiencing a girl, experiencing a guy, and without having to place limits or labels on it. You know what I mean? Like in the 80s, everybody was just kind of free or and it was more about the actual sex it's changed a lot and evolved a lot and we'll talk about that more yeah. exactly 80s for me i was having a great time right yeah because you know? it was free sex yeah. it was like the extension of the 70s which i was not a part of because i was too young um, but that was all free, free love and free sex and, you know, and all that. And then in the 80s, we got into, like, the rock and roll. We were all smoking weed, yeah. Smoking weed. Yeah. Did you smoke pot? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did cocaine when I was in sixth grade. Oh, you S did? Smoking weed. Yeah. I used to my, smoke pot. My stepsister gave it to me, cocaine. Was it real? Oh, yeah, it was real. <laughs> yeah. It was nice. I mean, you know, because... I was just a wild kid. I was pretty wild. You know, anyway. We could have never afforded it when I was growing up. And the first time I did cocaine was on my first porno site. I want to hear about that. I read some information on yeah. it. But let's go here. Do you, did you ever have a dream or an idea that you wanted to be when you were younger? You know, some, a movie star, a doctor, anything like that? Um... I wanted to be an actress when I was young. I wanted to be famous. Um, I didn't necessarily want to be famous in the adult industry, and I never expected that to happen. But when I was really young, I used to love animals. And ever since I was a kid, like anytime there's an animal around, even if it's the most vicious dog, like people come in with like, you know, cameo pregos, and they'll be like, they'll come over and they'll like, be like a little puppy around me. 
and dogs, animals, and children just take to me. So I always thought I would be like a veterinarian. Do you like to help people? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're a, a dude. That's, that's why I do a lot of advocacy work now. Humanitarian kind of? Yeah. Okay. What do you do? I mean, you say it real quick. What I do? You have to help people? I, well, right now I'm the sergeant at arms, and it's been for about nine years with the Adult Performers Actors Guild, APAC, the first federally accepted union really? in the adult industry. I didn't think about that. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, God bless you. In the best way, of course, you know? Right. Did you um, ever look at porn mags or porn movies before you got into biz? No. No. As a matter of fact, I remember the first time I ever saw a porn mag. I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> I was in it. It was, a, it was a hustler or one of hustlers, and it was after I had shot with them. And I walked into my, um, my family's home and my brother, one of my brothers was sitting on the couch and he was sh sifting through this magazine and I had brought it home because I was in it. And all of a sudden- One I, of your brothers, not Buck. No, but my brother didn't realize I was in the magazine or even that it was my magazine. And he's like looking through it and all of a sudden he looks what? and he looks at me and he goes, what the fuck? Because <gasps> this was like not ever going to happen. And how, Buck, how old? I was, um, I was 18. I was just 18 years old when I first started um, coming up to L.A. and shooting. And I was first shooting for magazines before I started doing porn. And um, my, this was like something that was never going to happen in my family. They were like, oh, no way, not my sister. No way, I'll kill you. I'll kill everybody around you. You know, that was their attitude. Because, because what I'm taking, what I'm getting from you, you know, not everybody knows your story, right? You have a, a radio show that you do. Maybe you've said stuff before, but what I'm getting from you is that you're kind of like a, a good girl a little bit. I was not a good girl. My family wanted me to be a really oh. good girl. Oh, shit, when okay. I was young, I was a good girl, but I was a bad kid. I was very extroverted. Once I came up and got into the industry, I was very sexually free and, and, and extroverted. I always have been. I'm very curious. You know, I will go to, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, when I was young, I would go to the Hellfire Club with Jamie Gillis in New York City and be like, oh, hey, wow, there's a guy in a bathtub getting pissed on. Oh, and my brother would be, oh, my God, that's so disgusting. You actually watch that? And I go, well, what's, what's the big deal? You know, he likes it. <laughs> so I've always been, like, sexually curious and... It doesn't, it doesn't affect me in that shocking way, you know, like it, it might some other people. Well, can you tell me about your first sexual experience? My first sexual experience, um, on the, you mean a, in the adult industry? No, oh. just in life. Um, my first sexual experience, I was young. I had a boyfriend. I dated him for a long time. And um, he... Uh, What's a long time? A long time. Two we were together for a couple years, mm -hmm. and he wound up. We wow. Two years of dating. Wow. Sad. Um, he was my boyfriend, my first love, when I was 16 years old. His name was Larry McKay, and we broke up because one of my brothers got him high, and he was my brother was shooting dope, and I that was like a, a boundary with me. And um, he shot him up. I don't know if he shot him up, but they were shooting up together, and wow. I knew it, and I didn't want that because I wanted, you know, whatever. I wanted something better, and, you know, I don't want to go here. And he, he killed himself when I was 16 years old. Because you broke up he with him? He shot himself in committed suicide in his bedroom, and wow. we don't really know. I mean, that, I'm not going to say that's mm -hmm. why. But it happened at about the same time, and it crushed us as kids. It crushed me um, when I was young. And uh, after that, I kind of withdrew emotionally um, from, you know, after losing my mom and then losing my first love and stuff like that. So I wanted to have, like, 
it not have to have all of this emotional attachment. You know what I mean? Because that would always hurt. You'd get crushed if you were like, you know, attachments, emotional attachments to your sex or whatever. And people always went away. So I, and it was traumatizing. It would be very traumatizing. So when I got into the adult industry, it was perfect for me because there was camaraderie, there was sex, there was a clique that I could finally belong to and I had never belonged to those cliques when I was young. You know, y'all wanted to be in high school. We wanted to be a part of the clique, but we weren't. No, no you lot. weren't part of it. I but wasn't. You, no, but, I got beat up by the clique member, and then I beat them up, and then they were all afraid of me after that. But, I mean, you were sexy, hot, body, everything, I, right? I, when I was not, I was, until I was about 16 years old, I was not hot, and then all of a sudden... I, d- I dropped all this weight, and I went from being this pudgy little... Really? They used to call oh. me Little Lenny. Little Lenny. And, they, and then I dropped all this weight, and I got some little boobs. And I was like, wow. And everybody started reacting to me differently. At and 16? I, and I was 16. Whoa. And then I was like... I can use this. No, oh, really? <laughs> I can You're use a plotter. This. There's, this, there's this moment Whoa. where every girl turns around and goes, this is going to work for me, <laughs> oh. right? This is going to work for me. And remember I told you I was always like, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be rich. And I had to make what I had work for me because it wasn't like I came from a family that was going to like hand me everything. So um, that was it. Then as soon as I put on a bikini and I started shooting, like I said, like shooting bikinis. And I was a model, even when I was really young. I had been a model. I did like all kinds of John Robert Powers and, you know, all this modeling stuff. So I, I was conditioned and conditioned it, you know. And then when I got into the adult business, I was primed. Because I had been shooting hot body contests and my brother, Buck worked the, um, as a security guy at these clubs in Anaheim, and I would go in and I would join these hot body contests, and I was only 18, like really, really young. You were 18. And I used my older brother's girlfriend's ID. Oh, so you had to be 21? You have to be 21 to get into those clubs, but because I was so, when a girl looks like really young and like new bill like that, you know, you win because everybody's like oh, looking yeah. at the young yeah. girl, right? But I, I, I had something just come to me. So this is kind of like guys that love girls. You know what I mean? If you see, you know, <laughs> it's perverted a little bit, but I'm a pervert, <laughs> right? Don't get it twisted. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> right? If you see, because you said you're wet, right? Uh-huh. So did you ever get so wet that you saw through the bikini? During one of my shows? Well, they used to put water on you. Period. So yeah, so photo shoots or, yeah. No, I know the you know, but a photo shoot. I don't know. I have to think about that. Because <laughs> let me tell Probably. you. Probably. Yeah. Because one of the best feelings, you know, when you're, I don't know, any time, right? When you meet a new girl or any, even with you're with your girl, you reach the hand down, and then you touch it, and you get into the panties, and you touch the pussy, and it's all wet. You're like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing, right? When it's a really gushy, like you say, right? right? You'd be like, what the fuck? This is beautiful. Hey, you know that business is about ready to happen, right? Because it's ready to go, right? right? And not every girl has wet pussy, you know? It's just some girls are chemically, you know, made up in different ways, so. I think that some people <clears throat> are not able to relax, even in the first times, you know, and that can be difficult to do. And it is an art in the porn industry, you know, to be able to walk on a set and go, okay, let's shoot. And just be like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? You know, what do you like? What do you don't like? Blah, blah. But then when you make that sexual contact, you can't fake that part of it. It's not acting because this is physical chemical reaction well, to each other. Today, you can fake it. The guys, <laughs> the guys can fake it because I hear stories all the time, right? And because I always talk about this and people might get mad. Oh, well, well yeah, yeah, you're an asshole, TT.
to make that connection. Otherwise, the girl doesn't get wet, and if you're not really wet, it's it's difficult to do, especially at the high velocity that we would shoot scenes and be like, remember, be like fucking boom, 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 and all this shit going on. And then we would do all this shit that was never even heard of before. I was the one that did the first ever double vaginal penetration. Really? They didn't do it in the 70s? Happened during the uh, Dark Brothers. Um, what was happening was me, Ginger, and Tracy Lords <laughs> were Tr on a movie. It was Vanessa Del Rio's movie, and I was beside myself that I was going to work with Vanessa Del Rio because Vanessa Del Rio was a fucking legend. Really? At this time. Big I'm ass clip. Big, but she was like, I just thought she was so, Vanessa Del Rio was just so beautiful. She was just not so, your blonde, you know, uh -huh. not like after that, it, it became like a science, blonde, white blonde, certain lips, certain boobs, whatever. So she was beautiful face? Vanessa had this big lips and she's beautiful, like Latina, you know, just Vanessa's just beautiful. Really? And she had big giant tits and she talk about like cock sucking lips and get right up in your face. Really? She was from the hood I, a little bit. She was a hood. She was a hood. She was, she was from, from the, hood. New York, the New York hood. Puerto Rican or yeah. Cuban or something. And so, and she'd say, what are you guys going to do? Well, me, Ginger, and Tracy Lords were all competing in that movie. Competing? Was, to who was going to be the best. We always competed. Who really? Who was going to do the hottest fucking scene. We were going to outdo each other all the time. So you, Tracy, and Ginger. Me, Tracy, and Ginger were in this movie together, and we were always competing. And Ginger hated Tracy Lords. Hated Why? It. Why? From the day they walked on set together. I don't know <laughs> what it was between those two, but Ginger hated Tracy Lords. She would say to me, you can't be her friend if, if you're going to be my friend. And I would be like, oh, well, that's fucked up because you have to work with each other, right? But she'd go, I fucking hate Tracy. And then look what ended up happening at the end of the day. And I was like, wow, because Ginger said, I told you, and, you know, and all that. But she hated her from way before that. How was Tracy, though? Was Tracy she? was cool. I mean, with me, you know, Tracy and Buck had some kind of a dating thing. For oh, yeah? Me. Yeah. They, All right. They, they did. So I... She was know, hot, right? She was really hot. She was definitely not underage or acted in any way suspected of that. There were other girls like... Um, Christara Barrington, I had heard that. Stacy Donovan. Oh, she St was fucking hot. Stacy Donovan looked underage. Really? Yeah. She was beautiful, right? But she had little tiny breasts, and uh -huh. she and they were kind of underdeveloped, and she had... Yeah, and she was really beautiful, but uh -huh. she looked very teen. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Tracy Lords did not look teen, and she did not act teen. She acted tough and right up, she would get in your face and like antagonize you really? sexually, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And so when that came out with her, I was like, oops, but I didn't work with her. She was on several of my movies and I didn't work with her, so I didn't get caught up in all that shit. You know, so yeah, I, uh, didn't, I usually would not work with the girls that were my brother's girlfriends. Oh shit, that's cute. Later. Yeah, I don't like that kind. Of, that's that's not uh, right. I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. So I feel the same way. We had boundaries. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, right. It feels dirty, right? <laughs> Even right. though we're uh, whatever. Right. Yeah. All right, so you know, let's talk about the romantic golden years of porn in the beginning, right? So okay. we we already touched it a little bit, but let's get to the nitty gritty. All right, <clears throat> when how. Where, why did you get in the business? Well, I came up into the industry and I started shooting magazines. I met, it all happened very quickly. I met Bill Margold and I met, um, I was coming up to the Rainbow Bar and Grill and I met, um, Althea Flint and Clive McLean, the senior photographer for Hustler yeah, I work with at the Rainbow. And he came over to me and said, uh, 
we want to we want to talk to you. Why don't you come to our table? And I was like, oh, I'm a model because I had been in all kinds of modeling magazines. You know? Yeah, I had hmm. done like Sears and Roebuck, and I had you know I was I had done all kinds of mainstream modeling, and um, they were like, come over to our table. And so I sat down at a table. It was Clive McLean and um, Althea Flint, Larry Flint's wife was there and I think Alon Friend was there and there was like a bunch of people. Anyway, Clive started talking to me and saying, she should shoot for Hustler. Don't you think she should shoot for Hustler? And Althea was like, yeah. And I had actually been offered to shoot for Penthouse. And I said, oh yeah, they offered to shoot me for, offered me a shoot with Penthouse, but I'm still trying to think about it. And they were like, Penthouse, the minute they heard Penthouse, because they were competing magazines back then. You, they want to shoot you for penthouse. Oh no, you got to come down like this week and blah blah blah. So Clive was like this English chap who I, we became best friends. It really? Was, yeah. He drove this '64 Corvette, and <laughs> he was like, "Oh, you got to come down. We got to shoot you immediately." And so I started shooting right away, and then I I started. Um, you know, I just met everybody. I met Bill Margold, and Bill Margold introduced me to all these people in the porn industry. And I just, first it was. But first is the magazine. First I started doing magazines. And once I did a magazine, I was shot every day. I was shooting every day wow. for magazines. Clive shot me for Hustler Chic, Gentleman's Companion. I think on um, on the Hustler shoot, the second, he first he shot me as a centerfold, and then I think the second one was this truck driver shoot where Tom Byron was on it. And they were like, do you know who that is? And I was like, yeah, he's a dweeb. <laughs> <laughs> and so I saw Tom, I was like, because I was like, I had all these cool older brothers, right? <laughs> right. And I was like, they go, he's this porno uh, stud. And I go, he's not, he's, uh, porn. <laughs> he's I thought he was a dweeb, right? And so they were like, no, that's Tom Byron. He's fucking you know, <laughs> of pornos, he was like the dude, and he shoots for everybody. And I was like, really? <laughs> uh, you know, because Tom had really short hair back then, and he made, young. he made his look like a young boy, oh. remember? Yes. And he specifically made himself look that look, yeah. like a young boy. Anyway, he was the dude in the porn industry, and then... He was popular. Uh, Bill Margold introduced me but, to Reb Sawit. I know Reb, but how much, because people want to know this before we go too far, your first shoot, how was it, and how much did you get paid? I don't remember. I don't remember how much I got paid. Centerfold. Oh, my first centerfold shoot? Yeah. Oh, the first time I shot as a centerfold, I got $1,500 because mm -hmm. Hustler paid 1500 And then I got 500 extra as a cover. Cover. For that me, I was like... I'm a fucking model. <laughs> I was like, what? I made, I think, and then I got like extra because you, you made a lot of money shooting with Hustler. And they shot like four layouts with me within like a month and a half because the minute they were like, they knew they were competing with this pet house thing. And I shot with pet house with um, uh, Stephen Hicks. Hicks, with Stephen Hicks. So I, within the course of about, two or three months shot about five, half a dozen layouts. And I got covers and you got 500 extra if you were the cover. And so covers I- Covers all the time? Yeah, the first thing I did, the yeah, the first thing I did was I went down to Orange County and I bought a brand new IROC out of the oh, showroom. I have a color. At, right? What it color? Black right. and black and that gold. T-tops? It, it was the T-top. <laughs> I rock. I went right down. I bought a brand new I rock, and I was like, Camaro. I, it's a Camaro. It's a Chevy. And I thought I had just that was it. That was it. It was a new car. It wasn't an old car. How it much? Was, it did was. It cost? I don't remember how much it cost. It was probably about twenty eight thousand, right? Whoa! And you bought it cash? I don't remember if I bought it cash, okay. but I got. I bought the car, and I was able to get the car, and then I had like. I think I bought, I think I got a credit. I got credit because I put cash down and got a credit. And then all of a sudden I had a car. 
car payment. And I was like, legit, right? <laughs> I was legit. And it was like, no more fucking bleaching your hair out of the box from the oh, pharmacy shit, yeah. from CVS or what, whatever. What's right it? In. We're going to go get a <laughs> professional hairdo. And we're going to, and that was it. After that, that was, it was on. But how, how was the shoot? You know, because your first shoot, well, I want to know the I, emotions. I, okay, so there was a, a company called R.B. Kane. I don't know if you remember them, but they the, used The to, magazine shoot, though. Yeah, the magazine. Right. Oh, when I did the Pretty Girls? Yeah. Oh, I. The for Clive, you know? Yeah, I was, he treated me like a queen. I mean, his house was in Beverly Hills. Okay, so I'm on this shoot, and I'm shooting, I remember one of the first ones was this chic layout, and he had built this waterfall of rocks out of his pool and all this stuff and they made a really big deal and treated me like a star and you have a professional makeup artist and they're and everybody's going why do you want to shoot porn and i'm like why wouldn't you want to <laughs> i just got fucking 1500 dollars. i shot for three days i haven't made this kind of money in my life ever being from orange county you didn't make that kind of money well, back then. what were they paying you for a shoot the regular modeling shoot a regular modeling shoot, you would get like 125 bucks a day or whatever for mm -hmm. you, right? You would right. you wouldn't get anything. You would nothing, and then and they treated you professionally. Hustler was good, but here's what where there was a switch for me. There was something going on um, around this time, and for some reason, Larry Flint came to Clive's house in Beverly Hills. And I had no idea. What year was this? This was in 1982 or three. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't hurt yet. He was. He was. Okay. He was hurt. Okay. So this is the Disabled. first time I'd ever seen. He said, you know, Clive said, you know, Larry's coming. Larry's coming. Blah blah blah. And I think he came without Thea, but I remember this big black car pulls up outside. And then um, Clive's like, you know, whatever, be cool. This is the boss. <laughs> yeah. You're going to meet the really? boss. And I was like, what? I had no idea who Larry Flint or the backstory was until they brought him in in a wheelchair in Clive's house. And he stayed on the top of the foyer because there were stairs and they would have had to bring him down. Whatever he did, there was some kind of interaction with him and Clive. And um, they were really close. Clive was really close. And so I used to, after that, I went to the office all the time with Clive and we'd go sit with Larry. And I was just, the whole thing with like what the adult, being in the adult business was about was explained to me by Larry Flint in a way that I could understand it, that this is not about pornography. And it is. It's about pornography, but this is about your First Amendment. I'd never even thought about a First Amendment at that point. I was a kid from Orange County. What? What's a First Amendment? Which you is free I mean? speech. Which, which is free speech and why we're fighting for this. But then the way it was explained to me with, at that time, you know, where Ozzy Osbourne had, or he bit the head off a bat, and, you know, and that was, it was all culminating in these years. And, um... And I was like, wow, I can be a part of this movement. It's a movement. And so it became really important to us at a very, very young age. Now, my brother was not in the business yet. Buck was not around. Buck was still down in Orange County working at fucking Muggsy Malone's as a doorman. <laughs> and then Buck was like, found, he saw like me coming home with all this shit, right? Like, oh, she's got a car, how'd she get this? She's modeling? And then my, told you, my one brother saw me in a magazine and told him, and he said, that's it. I'm fucking going up to LA and I'm gonna bust her ass. And I was on a set and this was after I had shot several things and I was on a set. Several movies. And I was working for, um, John Holmes was the production manager. It John was a, Holmes was the production manager? Yeah, he, it was his movie. And he was doing a series. You know, you're the cook, the bottle washer. It's your series, but you're shooting, and you're yeah. also talent. And mm -hmm. It was for Bill Emerson. Anyway, I think it was a movie called Body Shop. And um, 
I was on the film and I'm in the makeup chair. My brother apparently went to Reb Sawitz and said, where's my fucking sister? And how, do you, so how do you get there? He, however he found out, he found out, did his investigating. So they brought Buck to the set. So Buck comes there and he meets John Holmes. Well, apparently this is all going on and downstairs and I'm up in the makeup room and he's like, I understand my fucking sister's there. And he's like, dude, your sister's a fucking 19 year old woman. She's not a kid. It's my kid sister, blah, blah, blah. So he's like talking to him and I apparently Buck and John Holmes had a conversation and John's like, wow, you're a fucking stud. Look at you. Da, 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 da. Why don't you be in my movie? I'll set up a shoot and you can have these two chicks do a, a oral on you and I'll put you in my film. Apparently there was this whole deal made with my brother and John Holmes <laughs> without me even knowing about it, without me even thinking it could be possible. And the next thing I know... My brother comes walking up onto a set. I'm in, in a movie, I'm in, and I'm like, ah! So I'm like <laughs> trying, trying to run in the bathroom, and I'm thinking, what the fuck is going on? What's going on? And my brother goes, I already know. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. I already know. It's cool. But I was always doing crazy shit because I was, I was already thinking, I don't give a shit what my family says. I'm, I'm already decided I'm shooting. This is my new job. I'm, you know, I'm an adult film star. You know, Bill Margold used to always say, you're an adult film star. Okay. Uh, Bill was great, huh? And he never let you call yourself a porn star or a performer. Remember, he wanted to say you were a star. And so my brother shot with John Holmes, shot a scene for him. And apparently he paid him four hundred dollars or something, whatever it was. My brother had this whole story, and it was true. He said, "I went up there to bust my sister and to hold these people accountable." And the next thing I know, I'm on a porno set, and John Holmes is directing me because John, it was his shoot. You know how mm -hmm. you do the shoot, hey, and you're yeah. also in the scene and whatever. And so that's what he did. Did Buck watch movies? You think before? Because John Holmes was a big deal. I don't know what Buck did okay. because he would have never shared that with me. Mm -hmm. And that we had really clear boundaries as brother mm -hmm. and sister. You know, like when I did the movie Babe Watch and I was in Buck's series Babe Watch in 1993. Yeah, I was in they paid me an exorbitant amount of 20000 right? To do a girl. It was two girl-girl scenes back-to-back -back that was shot within two hours that was put into two movies. And they gave me $20,000 to get me. That's awesome. So what ended up happening, I was like, oh, yeah. So hmm. it turns out I have to work with April Adams, who Buck is dating at the time. Blonde. Yeah, the little blonde little chick. Little fat pussy. On right. Her. I so I'm like, okay, well, my brother is directing the movie, and JD is the cameraman. So I'm like, I don't give a shit. At this point, you know, we've been in the industry forever, and my brother would leave the set. He wouldn't be on set while I was shooting my scene. He would mm -hmm. direct me in dialogue, you know what I mean? And I was all good with that. It bothered my brother, though. And so my brother got fucking drunk on the set. And me and JD came. My brother was passed out in another room. And JD goes, oh, fuck, what are we going to do? Our director's fucking... And it was for David Sturman. He still owes me 15000 David Sturman owes you 15000 Yeah. He's on my Facebook page. He's a prick. Fuck you, David Sturman. You're a fucking cockroach. Anyways, he's, when you meet him, he's nice. But, you know, that's his, that's his MO. But, <clears throat> so... Everybody knows that. It's not the first, you know, rodeo that he's done like that. But um, I want to know, because this is a question everybody wants to know. I want to get to the nitty-gritty. Did you work with John Holmes? Yes. Okay. So now we want to know. I worked with John Holmes four or five different times. Four or five different times. So you've been in the business. How big was his dick? And is the biggest dick you saw, or did you work with some... Some other I, it actors. was definitely not the biggest dick I ever saw. Um, John Holmes, for me, the first time I worked with him was kind of a bad experience. John Holmes had this thing about he didn't like glamorous women. 
he liked like young looking girls he had this thing where he didn't want glamorous and he used to say i hate glamorous blondes with big tits and i wanted to be like seika the minute i saw seika i was like that's me i'm this this is me i want you know i was like already wearing I wanted a ton of makeup. I wanted big hair. I was a punk rocker. I was a metal chick. I was not, I didn't, Ginger wanted to be the girl next door. I was like, good for you, fuck that, not me. You know what I mean? I was like, I do not want to be the girl next door unless she is a fucking slut. (laughs) And that was my thing, you know? I wanted that, Why? and that was all good. We were good like that because we had two completely different images. But John did not really like me when the first, and he worked with me because I was exploding and nobody could ignore it, you know? And um, the first time I worked with him, I remember it was in a jacuzzi, I think, and they're talking about this big giant dick, this big giant dick, right? And so he's in a jacuzzi and he was having a problem. The last couple of inches of John's dick never got erect because I guess it was so big, the blood supply wouldn't get up there. And I think it was like 14 inches or 13 inches, but the top of it was always like tilted, you know, and it was soft. So I would say, and he hated this. <laughs> so he says, I don't like chicks with big tits and blah, blah. And I'm like, hey bud, you having a little trouble there? <laughs> really? Do you need some help? And you're like 18, because 19? It, I go like, 14 you're cheating two and a half three inches of that oh and he would go fuck you because he's john holmes you know buck had always taught me even as a kid you never you never let anybody pick on you and he was picking on me so i gave it right back to him i go (laughs) bud you're cheating that last few inches there right and i did some great scenes with him i did dick man and throbbing me him and uh tom byron and Tom Byron plays Throbin and he's Dick Man and it was awesome and I played this really young girl, but the same thing where John would pull out this dick and he would have to hold it. Sometimes he would hold it with two hands to squeeze it so that the end of it would get hard and I would just look at him and go, why the fuck does he have such a big reputation for being whatever? Wasn't that big? It was, was it 13 it inches? It was big. Was it, it 13 inches? It was big, but it wasn't like that. Hard. Okay? It was like that. It, it was, <laughs> right? So who had a bigger dick in the business? So my experience with the biggest guy in the industry was Dick Rambone. Dick Rambone. And after I worked with Dick Rambone, I used to tease John and go, you know, you're, you're <laughs> slipping. <laughs> I used to tell him, you're slipping, dude. Guess what? Dick Rambone's going to come right up here behind you. <laughs> Dick Rambone was bigger around. He was a the guy they found in the Ozark. And he was like a hillbilly or something. But man, and he was the nicest guy. But he was a hillbilly. You know, he'd be like, hey, y'all, how, how you doing? I did. I did that movie with him, Let's Get It On with Amber Lynn, where we play Bonnie and Clyde. And they were like, you know, he's, he's a little slow. <laughs> and I was like, I can do it. I can handle mm-hmm. it because he's a little slow, you know? And I was like, that's okay. So he loved me because I acted. You know, we did Bonnie and Clyde together and I play them all and he's my sidekick and he's supposed to be kind of dumb and slow. But he, when he pulled out, he had the biggest fucking cock and it was like this big around, right? And they're like, I was like challenged by it. I said, <laughs> oh, fucking get this thing in, keep pushing, keep pushing, you know? And, and um, Alex Dorenzi. He was great. I loved him. That's who I shot with, with Dick Rambone. And he said, yeah, you're going to get that thing. And yeah. So, all right. Because, you know, not everybody knows Dick Rambone because he didn't do that much work, I don't think, right? No, I don't think he worked that much. So let's take somebody as an example. Shawn Michaels. You work with Shawn Michaels, right? I work with Shawn Michaels a lot of times. How, how much bigger was John Holmes than... How big is Shawn Michaels? He's about 11, right? Probably. He's pretty big, yeah. Yeah, he's pretty big. Everybody's different. 
and it has to do with the way that you connect with somebody. It's like there are certain people I can get into a scene with and I will allow the scene to become extremely aggressive because I connect to that person in a way where that shit's fine. It happens. You know what I mean? It's good. It feels good. I can do it. I'm wet. This. Um, and there are other people that I could never do that with because it would hurt. It would tear. It would whatever because you just don't have that thing going on, that animal thing going on. So Shawn Michaels is a very suave, classy kind of dude. Uh -huh. And I love him for that. And I've done some great work with him. And you don't even know it's happening. You don't mm. even get that it's like a third, whatever it is. It's uh -huh. a giant cock, you know, because <laughs> Sean's just so classy and cool and, you know, whatever. It's all good. Um, there was a guy I worked with for you, for your company, who's bigger than Sean. Oh, really? Who? Charlie Mack. Oh, Charlie Mack, yeah. Remember? Wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, I mean... I didn't work. Yeah, probably. I mean, I shot Charlie so many times. So yeah, probably. Wasn't Charlie like a little bit bigger? Feet? Probably. He was thirteen inches, wasn't he? It's pretty big. But so is that a good example? Of what? To Char to um, John Holmes. Similar. Char no. Uh. Uh. They're, those guys are bigger. Charlie's and bigger. It, it, yeah. Charlie's bigger. Sean's bigger. There's a different kind of a psychological thing that goes on when you're doing a BBC scene. Because the whole thing is just hotter and more of a turn on, and you've got this whole buildup around it's BBC, and it's <laughs> not like skinny John Holmes. Because <laughs> John Holmes was really skinny. Yeah. By the way, he was high a lot, too, yeah. when he was on set, and he was very skinny, and he was very coked out. So it was like, you know. It's, it's, so, so you think his dick wasn't fully hard, and it could be a lot bigger, or no? I think if his dick was was more erect, it could have been bigger. I will tell you that I did a I did a scene with John Holmes in um, in Rome, Italy, called "The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire" with me uh -huh. and Chicholina, and this is the scene where John um, had HIV and lied story. about it and didn't tell anybody. And the reason why he got away with it is because we flew to Italy to make a movie. And in Italy, they didn't have the same kind of, like, you had to test that. When I got a business, you didn't test at all. Right. Okay. So, in this particular thing, there was no test in Italy. And it happened about a year later. I came back, and Jamie Gillis, who I had lived with, who had been my boyfriend. Yeah, I want to talk about that. He called me, and he said, baby, I got to tell you something. You need to go get a test. And I said, a test for what? And he goes, for, for AIDS, because John Holmes had HIV, had AIDS, died of AIDS, or had AIDS when he worked with you in Italy. And I was like, are you fucking kidding? And it was really like, I just remember feeling like the violation of trust. And I talked with Bill Emerson, and he told me that John knew he had it and went anyway. I've heard stories about other people, too, in the business. I'm not going to bring them up, but I think that supposedly maybe at a Dorenzi set sometime, uh -huh. somebody, I'm not going to mention his name because I still like him, but... Supposedly, the, he was there and knowing something, and uh, we were all were up there. You know, me, Al, Imperial North, and Joey, and everybody. Anyways, but yeah, you understand that it's uh, not... You don't know who the person... You're not going to say who the person is you're talking about. Yeah, because I, I don't know for sure, but Joey said so for sure. Anyways. And it wasn't, it wasn't John Holmes? No, no, no. When I was around, John Holmes was dead by the time I got into business. But uh, this is, you know, somebody else. But I'm not talking about that person. I'm just saying I understand what you're saying. Right. Right. But yeah, I want because the violation of trust, because we build <clears throat> our, we, we, we're we able to walk on these sets and do what we do because we have to feel the free the freedom and the safe net mm -hmm. that everything's going to be okay. And when you find out that somebody has lied or they've misrepresented their status. Yeah. It's. It, make, it makes you so angry, you could literally, like, fucking kill them, you know? The, so I just want to lock it down, right? 
in the history books, <laughs> right? That Charlie Mack is bigger than John Holmes. I think Charlie Mack is bigger than John okay. Holmes. Okay. Yeah. Right, and so, he's a nice guy to oh, work with, too. Right? I love Charlie Mack. He We're, was he was my main, one of the main actors for my company, Base I just, I remember one thing. Charlie Mack was a really good guy to work nice, with. Nice, great guy. Yeah. I love him. Cool guy. Cool, big dick. Nice. You know, love the girls. He loves girls. Sweetheart. And also, we want to say one thing while we're doing this show, that this show is brought to you by Evasive Angles. So, Evasive Angles is the company that is producing this show and paying for this show. So, EvasiveAngles.com. Anyways. Evasive. EvasiveAngles.com. And I shot movies for Evasive. Yeah, you shot. Yeah, I got all that stuff. But yeah, thank you for doing that. I don't want to go too far. I want to... um, Go back here. So, in your first scene, so the first was the magazines, right? You did for Clive, Uh right? Clive was a cool guy. I worked for him for two shoots, you know, for Hustler. And then, um, how much did you get paid your first scene? So, you don't remember that part you said? You know, I don't remember what I got actually paid for my first scene. I'm going to guess, and I know it was less than what I got paid for a magazine shoot. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, a thousand bucks? I'm going to guess it was about 750. Uh-huh. So tell me, can you tell me about how how that happened? How you got on the porno shoot? How you were booked for that shoot? How? Why did you agree to it, right? How did you agree to it? And who was it for? And how did it go? Okay, so I started working with Bill Margold. I met Bill Margold in his office and he took me to Reb Sawitz. And the who, minute who I... Who was an agent? Everybody wanted everybody to know. Who was an agent. Pretty girl? Pretty girl. And they were partners. And I went to this place in Hollywood and the first thing Bill Margold said to me is, wow, you are going to be a legend in this industry. Really? And I was like, really? And he was like, I used to wear um, guest jeans in the 80s with pumps, with high pumps, right? And like nobody wore jeans with pumps back then Uh because, you know, everybody was from the 70s and they wore like sandals and, you know, like platforms, but they didn't wear like high-heeled pumps. This is 82, 83? Yeah. Uh And so I, um, I walked into Bill's office and I had on white pumps and these, you know, guest jeans and, and a t-shirt and he's like, wow, I've never seen anybody wear a high pumps with jeans and whatever. Anyway, so he said, you're going to be a star. And, um, and I believed him. I believed Bill. You know? I want to give a shout out to Bill Margold. That's right. Because I love Bill Margold and Bill, you know, Bill Margold had my back and was an advocate of mine. He helped me in the business. So always only the best God bless him. Rest in peace. Yeah. It was the best. Yeah, Bill Bill Margold was my mentor. Bill Margold was my friend. Um, at her, from the day I set foot in the industry until the day he left, where I stood outside of his house, I was the first one to the door. I was the last one he spoke to. I was the first one the police called when he died because I had been on the phone with him that morning at 10.30 and I was trying to get him to go to the hospital because he had been having problems with his legs. And I was doing what I always did. I was bitching at Bill and trying to get him to do what I wanted. And he, was, he wasn't gonna go. But anyway, so when they found Bill dead in the middle of his podcast, he dropped dead. In the middle of his podcast, wow. um, they took the phone that had fallen out of his hand, and they hit redial. And they said, "Is this? Do you know William Margold?" And I said, "Oh my God, I knew it." They said, "This is the police." And I said, um, "Are you his family?" And I said, "You know what? I am his family." And they're like, no, we need to have his next of kin. And that was it. So I rushed over there, the whole thing. Um, And that was when Bill passed away. And we were all there for Bill. So he was somebody that I turned to, even when I was like at the top of my career and I would be on stages making $25,000, $30,000 a week, I would still check in with Bill, you know, 
on on my downtime and be like, Bill, what's up? And he'd go, you know. He was cool. So he helped you get on the shoot, the first shoot? Yeah. All, he helped me with Reb. He got me involved with Reb. And the first thing I started doing was um, hardcore magazines. We did hardcore still shoots. Really? Yeah, that they used to do, like, um, hardcore magazines. Let me tell people who what that means. That means you're having sex. You're having sex. You know, before They're shooting it. Before it's just a simulation, or you know, the other magazine, normal magazines that mostly you saw. Right. But you're having sex. Right. With who's the first guy? Um, I don't remember who the first guy was. It okay. was somebody who wasn't. I, I I can picture him in my head, but I can't. <laughs> picture what his name was his name was Craig something Craig something um anyway we did that okay, let me ask you a question about that part so you go on the shoot and you say okay I agree to do this boy girl magazine shoot with penetration no big deal to you you don't really care because you already had your minds made up well I was already starting to do um playboy style you remember on playboy you would shoot with like Ed Holzman and Suze Randall, and they would have you on the set, and it was like a step up from a magazine shoot, but it was, it was uh, videoed. And then when it would come to the sex, you would have to cover the genitals, and you would have to sit and grind on each other and, and act like you were simu you would simulate it and be like, ah, ah, ah. Were you fucking? No. And you weren't. No. And I was like, I oh, remember. Playboy Soft. It was Playboy Soft. So I had done several of these with them, and I mean, I was doing everything. And Reb always said, you know, when you're ready, I can give you this, or I'll give you that. And I was just working the circuit of what was available. And then um, I started doing the hardcore magazines. And I remember being on the Playboy shoots going, why? Why are we sitting here grinding on each other? Let's just fuck. You really? know? Yeah, I didn't care. I mean, I knew everybody. It was all the same people, you know. But you weren't fucking them yet. It was Crystal Breeze and Jay, Ste Jay Ster Sterling. I Sterling, his name was, and Jerry Butler was on those shoots, and and you know, and people like that. Was Crystal Breeze pretty? Because she looked pretty hot. Beautiful yeah. in person. She was so gorgeous. Spanish she, or, Sp or Latin or she something. She was something. Yeah. She I had remember. that look, right? Yeah, she looked like a Jacqueline Smith style. Yeah. Yeah. Really pretty. Really, really pretty, sexy. I remember her. Yeah. You know, from the movies. Right. Before my time, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so... So what so, happened with you? Were you watching movies already and you were like, I'm going to be a porn star? No, I was, I was really just always looking at the magazines, you know, and um, I watched some movies. But then one day I was at my father's place. He wasn't there. And then they had, he had the satellite dish with the American Triple Ecstasy, right? And I saw Angel Kelly fucking. Oh, I had yeah. this, I like black girls. I like all the girls, really, right? Every single girl. But when I saw Angel Kelly fucking, I was like, oh, she's making me crazy, right? Like the first girl I ever had sex with was a black girl. Anyways, when I saw Angel Kelly fucking, I said to myself, wow, I got to get in this business. Somehow, some way. Angel Kelly, for people who don't know who Angel Kelly is, Angel Kelly was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. She was, am I right if I say she was the first black female superstar in the industry? Like Probably superstar, but then the Sahara girl was really pretty, right? But she was later than Angel. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Wasn't she? I don't even know because all I know is I saw Angel Kelly and I said, I got to get in this business, you know? I was so horny anyways. It's pathetic. You know, you yeah. want to know how horny I was. And this was back in the day before they did, um, before they labeled um, working with black performers interracial. Yeah, right. Remember? That's kind of right. They didn't, they didn't, it was just, we were all people. And uh. <laughs> so I remember when they said, I, it was you. 
you said I want to shoot you. Do you do interracial? And I go, what race? And you go, what are you talking about? Are you kidding me? And I go, well, why don't with me? Call? No, I think it was probably Mark Anthony for my company. Maybe it was Mark Anthony yeah. for your company, but he said we want to shoot you for our company. Do you do interracial? And I was mm -hmm. like, what race? And he goes. What are you talking about? That's and Mark, I, not me. I go, why is it always that it's got to be black people if it's if it's interracial? I go, that's racist in and of itself. I go, I'm anti-racist. And he goes, oh, we're cool too. We're cool. <laughs> and I said, I just, I come from an era where we don't, we don't label somebody interracial because we never did that. You know, we came yeah. from before that. We came from before, like you said, they didn't have tests. They didn't have labels. That was kind of weird. They didn't even have trim pussy. Right. It was right? just more free. Everything was more free. But anyway, so back to, I don't want to lose track of that. So you, your first scene, right? So you're doing, the, you're doing the simulation, and then you do a hardcore shoot for a magazine? Yeah, I did a hardcore, uh, several of them. I did, I did quite a few of them, and that's where I met Crystal Breeze and Jay Serling. And then um, after that, we started shooting movies. I did movies with... Um, but Bill Margold got you on the shoot? A Reb and yeah, Bill Margold? Yeah, Reb and Bill Margold. It was uh, Vixens in Heat. Um, I, did, I did a movie with May Lynn. Oh, I loved her. May Lynn. I, got to work, I was a fan of her, so I got yeah. to work with her. Oh, you did? She was yeah. sexy, right? Yeah, yeah. I got to work with May Lynn, and she was this very free-spirited Asian woman who was uh -huh. just, like, super sexy. And right. Just like, oh, yeah. Hairy pussy. Right? But, it, but just <coughs> really sexually extroverted. Yeah. And it was just, and that's the people I learned from. That's your first shoot or no? Um, first of several shoots. First of several yeah. shoots. So, you know, the thing is, so you're just, to me, you know, when I'm, my first shoot, I'm like, oh, no, I'm a little paranoid a little bit. So you're, you know, um, I don't know, you know, nervous, right? Because Well, and then commercially, I worked on a movie with Bobby Hollander, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and he, uh -huh. he was one of the first people that I worked with, too. And with Bobby, um, Bobby wanted, Bobby had kind of groomed Shauna Grant. And his big claim to fame was he made Colleen Applegate, Shauna Grant famous. And Redhead. I, Colleen was a redhead. Yeah, she was the girl that killed and, herself. And Colleen too? Shauna, Shauna was, Grant, yeah. Shauna Grant and Colleen Applegate are the same person. Oh, really? Oh. So I met her and Daniel Martin on Bo um, at Bobby Hollinger's house. I thought Danielle was so sexy, but anyways. She was my best friend. Really? She was oh. my dog. She was my running buddy. She had big, fat pussy, hairy, blonde pussy. She made me crazy. And tiny tits, yeah. and she was super sexy. Hard body. We used to party together, and we were, <laughs> like, we were like fucking butt. Party? We, yeah. And party with what, everything? Oh, all of it. Okay. I, got uh, I love her. She, I, what, she was one, my dear friend. She's I, gone. I, she passed away oh, yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got her on Miami Spice when I went to go do the movie Miami Spice. I said I won't do it without Danielle Martin. Really? And she got to go on the movie. She was so sexy, she was right? So grateful. We were such buds. We used to fucking do so much cocaine. Ah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we used to get in so much trouble. But I met her through Bobby Hollander and. It that was like crazy. Anyway, so Bobby Hollander was uh, I w the guy who introduced me to freebase cocaine. Yeah, tell me about that story. I read that. I shot with him. First, I first porno shoot. I really, I didn't even my first commercial shoot. First, yeah, my first commercial. First shoot. shoot let's say yeah. yeah. So I and Bobby was very manipulative. So Bobby wanted to... New York guy, kind of, right? Yeah. yeah I, I was, shot for him. Yeah. Very manipulative, and he's always like, hi, and he was smoking his bass <laughs> was he? pipe. Was he? Back. Was he? Was <laughs> he? He was on the set, he was smoking the bass pipe. And he brought out this big, giant bong, and he said, hey, do you smoke? And I smoked since I was a teenager, and I thought it was... We used to do... Whoa. We used to take hits of pot out of a bong, right? Toke one hits. Uh -huh. And so I had no clue that that's not what he was handing me and i was like yeah and i took the bomb and fuck? he's lighting it and as he's lighting it i'm looking down and i see what's melting is not green it's white and i hit this fucking thing and i he's like hold it hold it hold it blow it out 
and I blow it out, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> We're ringing. <laughs> oh, God. What the fuck was that? And he goes, you don't know what that was? And I'm like, you know, oh, it was, oh, <laughs> it was on. It, oh, it was shit. such a wild time because within about a three-month span, I shot movies with him. I met Jamie Gillis. I met John Leslie. I was like on all this stuff. And what happened was Shauna Grant killed herself. She blew her head off. Did you know, talk, did you know her? I met her at Bobby's house with Lori Smith. And um, I don't remember why they were there or whatever. They probably came over to buy dope for him and buy drugs for him. <laughs> and, you know, and it was just like, I was like the new girl. I was like the new upcoming thing. And 18, 19 years old, right? I was a kid. I was really young. And I remember um, that's how I met Gloria Leonard was because Bobby had this dog that was a French poodle. And he and Gloria Leonard were, had been married, but they were getting a divorce or something was going on. And he had this dog and he was abusing it. And so I took the dog and I put it in my car. He <laughs> stole the I dog. Stole, I said, I'm taking the dog because you're not treating the dog right. So Gloria Leonard called me up to get her dog. And she was like, keep the dog. She goes, it's my dog. It's not his dog. Please have the dog. And so I took care of her dog. And what ended up happening was... Gloria Leonard became the publisher of High Society Magazine. And because I took that dog on that day and took care of that dog, she started putting me on the cover of High Society and in Centerfold and was like the new queen of porn. All those covers you see of me on High Society where it says the legend continues, the undisputed queen of porn, it was all Gloria Leonard because she loved me and she believed in me and she groomed me so positively and I had no mother remember I told you I had no mom and Gloria Leonard was like this first female positive influence her Seika those were my role models women who were like strong and they were embracing their sexuality they were marketing themselves you know marketing themselves so when people would say you're being exploited by the porn industry i'd go what the fuck, fuck, you. fuck you i'm exploiting myself oh, god bless us nobody's got their hand on my fucking bank book but me motherfucker i can clue you on that and remember what i told you even when i was a kid i was like the money i was like ching ching my brother used to tell this joke about me here's my sister my, you sweat a lot. Can I have my $1,000, please? Because I would be like, boom. I was the first person who said, I want 1000 bucks a day. Really? They said, you'll never get it. How can you ask for it? I asked for it. I got it. Ginger's like, she gets 1000 bucks a day? I want 1000 bucks a day. I want 1500 bucks a day. So then we're like, okay, well, I'm going to get 1500 bucks a day. Really? <laughs> then we were like, oh, it went from there. Then it was like, we want to go places in limos when we go to the Vegas show. And we want our own makeup artists. And we want this. And we, well, if they can do it on a Hollywood movie set, why can't we do it in the adult industry? Every single thing we ever asked for. They gave us. We yeah. were that popular. I'm going to go back to Bobby Hollander. Okay. Because I want to know, you took that hit of crack or coke, whatever, right? It was free base. Free base. There. It was the real Clean, stuff. right? The real shit, right? Right. So you're, in, you're, tri you're feeling good. So did you do the scene before or after you did that? It was a day or so later, mm. and I had been up all night partying at Bobby's house. Danielle was there. It was when Lori and Shauna Grant came in. Everybody smoking? People were coming in and out, smoking. I could Free a base. Lot, a lot of people were there. <laughs> a lot of big people. It was back in the day when, you know. Yeah? Yeah, he worked with Arrow, the film company. Right, right. Uh, Norman Burkoff, Arrow. But, and you know who's married to Norman Burkoff's daughter now? Huh. Rob Lowe. Really? Cheryl Burkoff was my makeup artist and my friend. She's oh. now Rob Lowe's wife for really? like 30 or 40 but years. But you know who took over Arrow, right? Was... Butchie Piranha. Butchie, yeah, Piranha. Yeah. So I worked with them. Deep Throat. Yeah. Producers I, of Deep Throat. Yeah. Gangsters. I, 
they were fucking <laughs> crazy. So they were like, you can do anything you want. You can have anything you fucking want. Your face, your face is selling this shit. Yeah. Your face it's a beautiful is selling time. this shit, right? You, you're gold. And so we went, they took me to the AFAA. It was the Adult Film Awards, but it wasn't the AVNs back then. It was called the Adult Film Association Awards or something like that. And Seika was there. And I met Seika. And I will never forget the first time I met Seika. And they were like, this is Seika. And I, was, I just looked at her. Okay, so to me, I was like a fan of punk rock. Wendy O. Williams. And I looked at Seika and I saw Wendy O. Williams. Uh, she was like punk and she was awesome. And she was like hot and beautiful and gorgeous and rich and famous. And I was like, why wouldn't I want to be this? Why wouldn't I? You know? So that was that. Seika was nice. Yeah. Well, she is nice, still alive. Yeah. But um, I never worked with her, but she she was sexy. So, this back to the, you know the Bobby Hollander, right? Did the you did the shoot? Did you smoke while you were doing the scene? No, I think that you weren't allowed to. Okay, I never saw drugs on the set when I was on the sets. I think that they didn't let you do them on the set. You had to mm -hmm. wait until you were done. And I know that. I know that we didn't do it. I remember there was this shoot I did with Ginger and Vivid and Sharon Mitchell and all these people. We were out at Porter's Ranch or some ranch doing this shoot. And we all went back to my house afterwards and fucking would score. We'd have the shit delivered by the time we got Cocaine. there. After the shoot was done. Because uh -huh. we all got paid fucking thousands of dollars and we were kids. We were fucking... 19 years old and we'd be like oh, I got three grand I got two grand I got a thousand Mitch was there and we would all pile into my fucking I rock and all that and drive back and it was it was a crazy time it was a big crazy and you know Ginger had epilepsy what? she has some and she kind was smoking of, she had ep she has some kind of an epilepsy was she smoking too whatever it was she had an epileptic attack on one of the parties and Ed Holzman had to come and I think it was Ed Holzman she was dating or something he had to come and get her and I remember I don't remember if it was Jamie or who I was with at the time and he was like see what's gonna fucking happen to you this is where it's gonna go for you and blah 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 and I was like I I saw it you know what I mean like the writing on the wall of where we would be so out of control with our using and it would be like, I remember, <laughs> what's her name, was walking around with a pile Who? of fucking, <laughs> Ginger had a <laughs> pile of fucking cocaine on a mirror, right? And she would go, you can have this little tiny line, and you can have this, and I'm going to keep all this. Really? <laughs> wow. And you'd be like, you fucking Bogart, give that to me, <laughs> you know what I mean? And the next thing you know, the woman's having a fucking seizure, right? Gets up. Is there anything left? <laughs> wow. Literally, this, and we would be like, yeah, don't do her shit. She'll be okay in a minute or whatever. You know, the way things would happen with all of us. Huh. And I remember we, we used to use to such excess. And I remember her, us having to call, like, you know, whoever it was, and I think it was Ed Holzman, who came and got her and was like, how could you let this happen? And we were like, you know, we were just so high. We didn't know. But that was offset. But that was what we were doing off the set, you know. Remember Chuck, Tony, Martino? Oh, yeah, I dated him. He was right. my boyfriend right. for a while. That's what I say. So he told me that you introduced him <laughs> to the pipe. I did? <laughs> yeah. And he said, uh-oh. He, he said that? Uh, I did. I thought it was bad. It wasn't says, me. He says you. Because you were going out with him and you say, here, try this. I probably did. <laughs> I would guess that. And is he okay now? I feel really bad. I bet I owe him an amends. Uh, I mean, he's not. 
He's not saying anything bad because he said, oh, you were hot. You know, he loves you, right? Yeah. But no, we dated. We were actually boyfriend and girlfriend. Mm -hmm. We actually had a real relationship How was for a that? while. He was great. He was amazing. He's an amazing person. I always liked him, you know, after that. And we were really young. We were really, really young. And, um, yeah, he was Buck's roommate. That's how I met him. Uh -huh. He was my brother's roommate. I think he said something like that. Yeah. yeah, and I think I remember that happening. He's a smooth talker. Who? Chuck. He's different now. When he was young, he wasn't like no? that. He was much more innocent. I remember when he was really, really young, he used to wear these like Ralph Lauren high neck sweaters, which is what I liked about him is because he just seemed like he was such a straight guy. He was like a almost collegiate. He was like collegiate. Baseball, he was right? very yeah. innocent. He play, yeah, played baseball, whatever. And then he became like this hip guy later on, this kind of smooth talking guy later on. And I remember working with him maybe 10 or 15 years later for his company or whatever. And I was like, what happened to you? You got like all, you're all like personified now, you know? And he's like, well, look at you, you know? Cause I oh, went right? from being wow. like just this whatever. And then I had a boob job and all this stuff happened. Wow. That's a, that's and that's when Al weird. Brown was young, really young. And him and Chuck Martino were, what Chuck Martino, is that his professional name? Tony oh, Martino, Chuck, Chuck Agazino, right? Okay, Chuck, that's Tony right. Martino, right? That's right. Chuck Agazino, that's right. And okay. Al Brown is and Peter North. They were friends. They were best friends. They were best friends? Yeah, they were best of friends, and they knew each other. We worked together all the time. All the time, all of us. Yeah. I was, yeah. I was a fan he of that. He was like too. the machine. Al Brown was like a machine. Yeah. He was unstoppable. I loved working with him. I've always loved him, loved working with him. He's always been amazing professional with me. I know that uh, about a couple of years ago, there was like some big, huge situation with him and he got married and there was a big fallout. And they came to me and said, <clears throat> you know, do you know what he's, you know, about and blah, blah, blah. And I said, that is not the guy I know. Oh, the nicest guy around. I've been with him in high intensity scenes. I've been with him where, you know, I just can't imagine him ever raising his hand to anybody uh. like that. I, I can't, you know, I know that a lot of people say that about Ron Jeremy, um, but, you know, I know different about that. But I know with with him, and even when I saw him immediately at the at the tribute, I was like, "Hey, buddy, blah blah blah," and he was just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I, I always see now very calm and quiet. So I don't, I can't believe any of that other shit. You know, only the best about Al. You know, so yeah. <clears throat> anyways, anybody, everybody has different chemistry, and. Everybody has a switch and everybody has a limit. And if you've got one of those people in your life that likes to work your limit, <laughs> and I've had it, you know, where when I was training and I was dancing on the road and stuff like that, and I was training and I was doing supplements and stuff where I was in a relationship and started fucking fighting. And if they were like those kind of people who wanted to fight all the time, you can only do it so far. and you know, yeah. it'll get out of hand. So it can happen to any of us. It's where we learn that we're in over our head. We got to let go. So you jaded Chuck, and it was a nice time, right? He said I jaded him. No, I mean dated. Oh, dated, dated him, yeah. Me, not jaded. Yeah, dated. I dated Chuck uh, in between Jamie Gillis. Yeah, so I, I want to go to Jamie Gillis. Yeah, I dated Jamie first. Because I want to let the let it be known that I know Jamie, right? right? And we know that Jamie was a kinky guy, so I want to hear you know, some information about how was it, you're young, dating Jamie, who was a super famous porno star at that point yeah. in time. He's intellectual. He's an interesting guy. I always liked him, right? Yeah. A very likable, likable guy. Yeah. Cool guy and a superstar. So tell me, what was it like? Jamie Gillis was like, you know, Bo Derek and John, what's his name? Derek. John Derek for me. He was a lot older than me. 
he taught me a lot about the industry, but he also cultured me um, not only in life with art, he took me to art, he took me to theater, he taught me about acting. He was a Shakespearean actor. He had been in a movie with Sylvester Stallone. He was in Night, Night, Night Hawk, Hawk, yeah. Night Hawks with uh, Sylvester Stallone. And, and he knew him. It wasn't like I just appeared on the set with you, like they knew each other from New York. So, and this was all just very comfortable. You know, Jamie was the one that introduced me to John Frankenheimer, the famous director, who was a fan of mine, who said to me, you need to be bigger than porn. You have that je ne sais quoi in you that you can be a great star in the mainstream. And I was like, I am a star and I'm fine right where I am. But he got me my SAG card. I was on that set. He put me in a movie with Anne Margaret and Vanity. And there were some other people on the set there too. But John Frankenheimer pulled me aside and said, I'm going to give you dialogue. And, and then I met Vanity on the set and she was dating Prince at the time. She's beautiful, right? Oh my God, she's fucking beautiful. And then she, I became friends with her. We bud, you know. And so we hooked up and Prince came and took us to lunch in his really? limo oh. because they were boyfriend and girlfriend at that time and they were doing a lot of coke and <laughs> we got fucking high yeah. in in the limo and i shouldn't have done it but then i went back on the set and john frankenheimer was like come on i'm gonna put you on set and deliver these lines and i was like fucking high and he goes he deliver this line right here and I remember I was on set, and Margaret is standing there, John Glover, all these fucking big mainstream actors. And I was like, I froze. And he goes, what is going on? And he pulls me aside. I'm high. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm high. It's, it wasn't my fault. I couldn't say no because I was so freaked out that I was with Vanity and Prince and what was happening. And he said, go home. Get a night's sleep and come back tomorrow ready to work and don't you dare show up here high. And I came back the next day and he put me in the movie and I got my SAG card and I will always thank him that I am a SAG actress today. He's a very nice because guy. Because of John Frankenheimer and what he did. Okay, so Jamie was, our sex life was insane. Yeah. It was insane. Jamie used to take me to the Pussycat Theater and... Um, I would dress in like hot pants and like high heels and do all this stuff. And Jamie would, like the guys would come in in the raincoats and they would be like watching us. And he would get off on it, like watching them watch me. And fucking they you. Would, they would watch, we would watch our movies. Fucking. Of us fucking on the big but screen. But then you were movie. fucking in the theater. Yeah. Or we would be fooling around in the theater and then the guys would be jerking off in the in aisles <laughs> around us. We did some crazy shit to New York and they made me queen of the Hellfire Club. There was like a whole ritual. I was with Jamie. They did this thing where they put this harness on me that all snapped and then um, they brought out a slave and I sat on a bar stool drinking champagne and <clears throat> I had these thigh high leather boots on and the guy crawled out and he was my human footstool. And I was drinking like champagne and that was, remember I told you about the guy I saw getting pissed on in the bathtub and all that? And I came home going, oh my God, you'll never guess what, it, what happened to me. I was just in New York and this and that. And people, my brother would be like, are you fucking crazy, sis? Are you fucking nuts? And I'd go, oh, it was awesome. Huh? And my brother, because remember how my brother's kind of conservative? He was like, whatever he was, but then he'd be kind of conservative about stuff. Oh, that's too much. That's yeah. crazy. And I'd be like, dude, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So what I was going to tell you about what happened on the Babe Watch movie is my brother got drunk and passed out. And I said to JD, I'm not going to get paid if we don't shoot this scene. Get the fucking camera. And J.D. goes, I'm up for it. If you are, we left my brother passed out in the back room with a fucking tequila bottle in his hand. 
and me and JD went and shot the scene, both scenes, came back, and when my brother woke up, he's like, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? We're like, dude, it's in the can, we're done. And I was already packing up to leave. Yeah, Buck, I was, um, I remember that he put me in a film, right, called Lethal Passion. So, you know, that's, it was nice, you know, because he was, um, I don't, you know, I was so young and not everybody would give me any good parts, you know what I mean? I just uh, stud, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, he gave me a nice part in there, so, yeah, you know, it was always nice. When you think it back in the old days, you know, when you think about, who, like you think about Jamie, you think, I think, you know, about Buck. It's a trip, right? Yeah. That, that is long gone, but you still have your um, fond memories. And of course, it's your brother, but you know, you know, Buck, you know, I work with him a lot, you know, on the sets and for him. He hired me all the time. So, anyways, for, yeah, anyways. Yeah. So, anyways, I guess that's just out of the blue, but um, you know what I mean? Dating Jamie was just wild and fun. It was wild and fun, and I fucked up in that relationship because I was partying hard off the set. Jamie did not do drugs at all. I was running around with my younger friends, and I was, like, a lot younger than him, and I wound up meeting some guy that was just some little Mexican boy that I was <laughs> partying with. And, you know, he would turn a blind eye and I ran off with him and um, ruined the relationship. I know I hurt Jamie greatly. I, he was, I, I'm, I'm 23 years sober now, um, but I wound up making an amends to Jamie um, before he died. And we were very close when he passed away. So you, did you like Jamie a lot? I, I mean, loved him, I was yeah. in love with him. I was uh, engaged to him at one point. Whoa. But I was in my youth, had I have been a woman and been grown up and realized what I had um, in front of me, I would have done things differently. But we all say, if I would have known then Should've what I could've. know now, I would have, could have done things differently because I now have a different experience. Um, but then I didn't, and so that was the way it was. And what ended up happening to me was I got so crazy and out of control because that's what was going on back then that I had I went up to Canada to start dancing. At, at 19, 20 years old? I was maybe 21. At first I went to, I was living with Jamie, and I went to Paris with Sharon Mitchell. Was she getting high too? Yeah, we used to get <laughs> high. Oh, so Charles Webb took us to Paris for four months to make a succession of movies, and Mitch and I went together. And I think it was in about 1987 this happened, and Mitch was like, I looked up to Mitch. She was sexy too. Oh God, and just so much. And sexy. we're still really close friends. I talked to her. Really? Oh. I just talked to her yesterday. Really? Day before oh. we text all the time. Oh. And um, we got on a plane to fly, and Hustler had commissioned Lawn Friend to shadow me and do a story on me in Paris, and they were doing a big shoot on me in the south of France, and. Um, we got on a plane with Lon Friend to go to Paris, and Mitch brought a bottle of Curvassier or whatever it was onto the plane, and we got drunk, and we had sex with Lon Friend and molested him. Under blankets. Who? In the back of a giant plane. <laughs> Lon Friend was like a writer for Hustler, oh, okay. and he was all this stuff. Anyway, once we got to Paris, they were going to arrest us because we were doing shit that was right out in the open. And this was in the 80s, you couldn't do that. We were having sex right on a plane. We were holding blankets over him and, you know, the world wasn't ready for the shit we were doing. I remember, you know, just as moving forward, I remember that I met, I, uh, we shot your condo in Oxnard around 1991, that sound familiar? And I saw you walk by, and I said, hey, but you know, you were on, it was your location, right? But At a condo in Oxnard? Right, does that sound familiar? 
for Buck maybe or for somebody. Was it in Oxnard? That near that, that area, yeah. As far as I can remember. Oh. But you weren't shooting there. We were using your location. Or maybe it was your girlfriend's location. But you Was were it an A-frame? Something like that, yeah, I think. It was okay. a long time ago. Anyways, just out of the blue, I, I said, hey. But you were uh, on the way out. And it was in the 80s? No, 90. In 91. the 90s. 90, 91, 92, something like that. Okay. Anyways, not important. But then we met, you know, for Buck's movie when you were the stripper. Oh, yeah, when, in, in nightclub. Nightclub. Yeah, right? yeah. At the strip club over there in Van Nuys. We met at that club, right? I said, hey, you said, hey, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, um, did you like girls? Were you in a girls? Yeah, I was. I mean, Ginger, I had sex with Ginger Lynn on the, um, at Harry Reem's house. Um, with Jamie, I was up there with Jamie, and um, she was coming back from the Playboy Mansion, and yeah, she She's said, doing. "Do you do you like tequila?" Got me drunk, and then oh really? Oh yeah, she was, <laughs> she was a rocket spartier. Wow, and um, yeah, so we had sex. I had sex with Ginger outside on the on the beach uh, chairs. And then, um, yeah, and then we became friends. Like, we saw each other at shows and stuff like that after that, so. So yeah. you like girls? I like girls, yeah. Did you ever have a girlfriend? I've had a girlfriend a couple of different times briefly, and it didn't work out. Um, but I'm mostly heterosexual, but I like women. Okay. I like women sexually, if there's a man involved, more than I would probably be in a relationship with one today. But you never know. Things can change. <laughs> did, did you like strong, uh, get fucked hard? Yeah. Or yeah. Power fucked? Um, on set, I want it to be an awesome scene. And so, yeah. I was probably one of the first power fuckers in the industry when we were coming out of the 80s. I was doing heavy hitting scenes, the more heavier hitting scenes. Again, like Ginger was the girl next door. I was not the girl next door. So I was doing more of that kind of content. I didn't do anal for a while in the industry. And then once I did, I did quite a bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. It felt good? Yeah. Yeah, I was fine with it. At first, I was like, oh, my God, no, you know, and then it became very popularized. But before that, it wasn't even popular. Oh. You're a strong girl. I, I see you as a strong person because when I when we speak about this, you're not saying, it, oh, well, I was kind of this. You're like, fuck it, right? Like, I'm down. Let's do it. Right. And no, no like, regrets, nothing. You're just like, let's get this shit done. Well, you know, life is that way. You know, if you... I've learned to be different. For myself, I have a huge ego. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, I, and I'm very deliberate and calculated about the things I think and want. You know, I, I'm very specific. But I work really hard to kind of offset that part of me by being of service, by helping others. You know, so that I can kind of work through those parts of myself. PT, right? I interviewed him, and he said that he did a lot of drugs, right? He says that, why would you want to have sex, you know, sober when you've gone so far out there with, um, with drugs and having sex with drugs that the feeling is so much better and so much more... Um, I don't know, you know, more in your head, right? Mm -hmm. So what, how do you feel about it? Do you like drugs and sex better than being sober? It's different. I've had sex with PT um, on drugs. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I, speaking of which, I've had sex with PT um, offset on drugs with him in stockings and garter belts, calling <laughs> kinky, himself right? Sally. Okay. Oh, share these stories. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Oh, stories. He can go there. And I was like, 
I was young and I was okay, but I remember I was dating and living with Jamie at the time and I had to call Jamie and say, I'm at PT's house, fucking stone. And he's like, what the fuck? Because there was like a professional respect and Jamie was like, what the fuck are you doing, man? You're like, my fiance. And I, you know, cause sometimes you get sidetracked, you know, cause it's a crazy, (laughs) lot of shit going on. and he was like, hey, do you want to you want to get high or whatever? But I understand that, and I've had that experience with PT, and it got really wild. There was... What kind of drugs? It was cocaine. And, Smoking it? Yeah. <laughs> so is it better with the drugs? It involved a hairbrush. Oh, shit. And some anal play and uh, a lot of stuff. It was... He's, uh, he's a wild character. He's, um, yeah. He's no more wild than Jamie was. Jamie was wild and different in a very dark way. Jamie was into anal. Jamie was into degradation. Jamie was into a lot of crazy shit. Some of it was too much for me um, in different ways. But, um, yeah. Do you agree with PT or do you think it's okay to have sex sober? Not okay, but which way way is better? Now, I, okay, so I'm different today than I was then. I now am 23 years clean off of cocaine because I had to be. It was killing me. So I know the other side and the downside and where it took me. And I then got clean and then wanted to come back to the industry. And because of the um, recovery that I had gone through, I had been taught that my sex, the time I was in the sex industry had been the catalyst for my drug addiction, and I learned otherwise. But did you like sex? I learned otherwise. Now, not only did I learn that one thing has nothing to do with an ad- other, being an addict and being a porn star or being in the sex industry has absolutely nothing to do with the other, unless, of course, you're an addict in the sex industry. Um, and then I had to learn to have sex sober, or I was gonna get high again. And then I started working in the industry again, totally sober. So it's different. It's a different thing. I like being coherent. For me, being coherent to your orgasm is having that feeling where you feel it all the way into the tips of your fingers and the, you know, you get the, you know, the, the, the bumps, the goosebumps and the whole thing. If you're loaded and you're disconnected, you don't feel it. You think you're having a great <laughs> orgasm because you're, wow, what's going on here? But you don't get that, like, connected to all those. My choice is going to be, because I want to stay clean, it will be, I'm good with it the way I have it now. But, but you had good times when you were getting high. Oh, yeah. I had good times until the wheels came off the wagon. Fuck yeah. that. And if <laughs> there was a way to do it again, I would. But I know better for myself. How many years did you party for, you think? My whole life. Heavy. Oh, yeah? No. Well, in the adult industry, probably for probably maybe eight years. But cocaine was the first hard drug you got these no 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 when i was a kid i did lsd down in orange county oh. i did pcp i did sherms i did cannabinol i came from a very heavily drug trafficked um community a uh, youth community Whoa. so we were into all that and we my brother sold it and it was Whoa. accessible okay but a lot of lsd we did a lot of lsd in the 80s all right so you like all right. So yeah. I mean, you, you, you so I've have, experienced my fair share. So you already did drugs. Yeah, I had already done drugs, but not cocaine. Uh-huh. Cocaine was different. It was more, um, more. If cocaine was real, it would be worth it. Today, it's not because it's not. It's mm-hmm. now meth and it's speed. Even at the end of my using, it was like toxic and cracky, and mm-hmm. you get paranoid instead of high, and you'd be peeping around and creeping out windows. And yeah, I was going to ask you. You get paranoid, right? People are coming to get me, and where's my <laughs> fucking shit? i got to hide my money, and who's got my stash? And it just wasn't fun anymore, you know? I mean, I don't know what PT is doing today, but... <laughs> he was he there. Was, he was at the thing. Yeah. I saw him from across the room. I was very... At Herschel Savage's memorial, I was very emotional. Were you, that were it you was close like, to him? 
Herschel? Yeah. I was close to Herschel more in my youth um, because, you know, I was off doing my life. But I was in contact with him in the last year and a half. I was going to go to his birthday party that it just happened. Yeah, and I, I got sick and I had strep throat and I thought I had COVID. And because he had, had been sick and sick, I, I said to him, I don't think I should come because they definitely have something and I don't want to make you ill. And so I didn't go. And he sent me these pictures of him on his, at his birthday and we were communicating right before he died. We were communicating through text messages. And when Bill died, he was texting me all the time when I was looking for the cat trying to find Bill's cat, and he helped me with that. And, you know, he was somebody who I, I mean, we made Trashy Lady together. It was one of our finest moments for both of us, the acting that we did in that film. We worked really hard. We studied the dialogue really hard. We character studied, and it was an amazing award-winning movie. And, you know, both of us were very proud of our work in Trashy Lady. I always loved Harvey. Herschel. He was the kind of guy you could not see him for five years, and all of a sudden you'd walk up on him the street and you'd be like, "Bud!" And that was it. It was like you, you it would melt away. But he never changed in that respect. Pretty he nice. never turned on you. He never backstabbed you. He never shit talked you. He was a Buddhist. He was a good guy. He was good. You know what I mean? And even if you turned around or things changed about you, he always had a way of being able to talk to you about whatever it was that was going on without making it offensive. He was you nice. Know what I mean? Nice yeah. guy. Yeah. He, like, you know, good energy is nice. I knew the minute he found out he passed away, I was going to go say goodbye. You know what I mean? Like, I had to be at that thing. Yeah. That day. I guess we got to fly. We're almost out of here. So we got to fly through these questions. <laughs> speed, <laughs> speed answers. Okay. And not Matt Speed. <laughs> <laughs> Which is your favorite film you ever did? Um, favorite film I ever did, Miami Spice or Trashy Lady. Okay. Do you think you had a lot of fun on the sets back in the days? Yep. Yep. What, um, do you ever look back in the 80s and say, whoa, that was crazy and fun? Or what yep. do you feel about it? I say, whoa, that was crazy, that was fun. And I also say to myself, how did I ever get out of it alive? Yeah. Because look how many people dropped. Yeah. Do you have a, a favorite scene you remember? Um, the scene I did with Herschel Savage and Trashy Lady was amazing. Really? Yeah. Good sex? Good. Yeah. Just right. real good chemistry. I want to name some old school actors. You know what I mean? Because I was a porn fan, right? Uh -huh. So I'm a, a yay or a nay or a yay. You know what I mean? Whatever oh, you want to okay. say. So these are, you know. Let's start Tony Montana. No comment. Nay. Nay or yay? Absolutely no comment. He okay. did something to me that... Um, oh, really? Yeah. Dirty? Yeah, he he did something really bad. Want to say it? No? No. All right. John Leslie? Love. How nothing, but, nothing but respect. How could you not love John Leslie, right? He was... Yeah. yeah I love John Leslie. Very, always nice. Respectful, you know? Even when you're a nobody, like when I first came up, just such a nice guy. Joey Silvera. Love Joey. <laughs> cool. Joey was like my crush, one of my really? crushes when I was young. I used to mm. love working with Joey. No loved shit. Joey. Always loved Joey. Yeah. Well, Joey and John were best. Uh -huh. They were like attached yeah. Well, friends. Yeah. And Joey, when he was young, was just, there was nobody like Joey. Yeah. He was I, the best. I work with him on many, many sets. I did Friday the 13th, The Nude Beginning with Joey Severa. Yeah? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> the real movie? No, a Nude oh. Beginning. New Beginning? Yeah, for Fred Lincoln. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter North. Love him. Love Al Brown. He loves you. Ton, ton, tons of movies. I asked him who he looked like better, Tracy Lords or Amber Lynn. He said Amber. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we did some great work together. You know, he used to do this thing where he would mix up some kind of a drink to make us come. So he would come. <laughs> He's crazy. And he would, like, come in buckets and stuff. Like, people still talk about it's him in, to this It's day. incredible, right? Right, yeah. Love Peter North. Mark Wallace. Um, I 
Mark Wallace, well, look what happened with Mark Wallace. So Besides that, that? Without what happened with Mark Wallace that I was not a party to, um, Mark was a friend of mine, and I um, tried counseling him after all the stuff came down with his addiction. So, yeah, that yeah. was, I, yeah. Yeah. I worked with him, and uh, he was one of the guys I worked with in that first uh, double vaginal penetration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still talk to him. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh. I talked to him probably six months ago, and he calls me. And I, when he... Is he a, I thought that he passed away. Oh, no, he's all right. Is he? He had a car accident, and he got... No, a, a trash truck ran his car over while he was in it. Uh-huh. So he got hurt, but he's okay. But um, when he had that problem and nobody would hire him, I put him in my screening room and let him screen movies. I gave remember him a job. you said that to me. Yeah. I remember that we talked about that when I worked with you, that you said, do you have a problem working with him because of whatever? And I said, no. Mm -mm. Eric Edwards. Love him. C wonderful guy. Yeah, right? just amazing. Paul Thomas. Paul Thomas. <laughs> ah, P PT and I have a storied history. Um, I respect him professionally, and I think he's amazing. Uh, we have had history there. We had a fallout on a project that we were working on at one point, and a huge disagreement around it. But, um, you know, I, I wish PT all the best. I heard he's been having some heart problems lately, that he had open-heart surgery, somebody said to what me. What the fuck, really? They mentioned it to me wow. with Herschel, when Herschel passed away, that PT had uh, open-heart surgery recently, fuck? and I was pretty shocked about it. Wow. So, But we definitely have some drama. There's some drama <laughs> in, the, in our history. Yeah. He was always nice to me. I always liked him. I still like him. Yeah. You know I mean? Ron Jeremy. Ron Jeremy. Well, um... Ron Jeremy, how do I feel about Ron? I'm glad that it's over. I'm glad he hurt people that I know. Oh, really? He hurt people that I'm close to. Um, it was hard for me to face. He was a friend of mine for a lot of years, and he never raped me. He didn't. But he did hurt people that I know. And so... Um, I'm glad that's over. You know what I mean? That that's not out there anymore. Rick Savage. He's a good guy. I worked with him once. Huh? I remember working good with him. Good scene? Yeah. Okay. Tom Byron. Tommy Byron. Um, I worked with Tommy in one of his projects not too terribly long ago. No, but... The whole you worked him n numerous times. Yeah, I worked with him, like I said, from the very beginning. Yeah, Tom was fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah I liked him better when he was a dweeb. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Uh, now, then he became like a rocker dude. Now he's kind of like a rocker dude, more of a rock star. Yeah. One time he was talking shit about me, right? I called him. I said, "Come on, Tommy. Don't fucking don't talk about me, man. Come on, I don't want to fuck you up." He, he said, "Okay, I'm sorry." He can do that. <laughs> huh? Yeah, he likes to do that. Anyways. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to punch. That's ridiculous, you know what I mean? But anyways, I like Tommy. So, Jerry Butler. Jerry Butler was one of my favorite people of all. He's funny, huh? Yeah, he was funny. He's a psycho. He's, yeah. Friends he, with Buck, though, right? He was best friends with Buck. He was a nut. I loved him. Um, you know, he was, yeah. Seemed cool. I'm sorry that when he passed away, I cried. Yeah. He got cancer. I met him a couple times. I met him a couple times, and uh, I like you know. You just he had that likable spirit. He was a likable guy. Um, Herschel Savage. Herschel was one of my favorite people okay. to work with. John Doe. Did you ever work with him? Um, I don't know. No. Okay. That was later on. You know, probably Randy Spears. Randy Spears. No. Um, yeah, I worked with Randy Spears um, when I worked on. The movie that I did with him, with Wicked, called The Housewives of Amber Lane. He was kind of um, spiraling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he showed up on set and oh, shit. couldn't shoot a scene because uh, he had been up all night uh -huh. and replaced himself with Evan Stone. Uh -huh. So, okay. yeah. Arbola. I liked him. He was good. He's a way back, way yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Some people probably couldn't remember, but Arbol, I brought it. I remember his name. So you worked with him. He was cool. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. He was in the movie Talk Dirty to Me. And I worked with him in Talk Dirty to Me. Right. Randy West. Love him. Still to this day, if I see him, really good. Have you talked to him? I haven't spoken to him like recently, recently. Uh, Randy West, if you if you see this interview, call me up, man. Come on the show. We're yeah. we're friends. Come on, yeah. man. I'd love to have you on here. Steve Drake. I don't think I worked with Steve Drake. Huh? Ray Mercer. I don't know. Um, Is that that guy wrong? Ray the the black actor Ray oh I, I was just Ray say Victory that. Ray, Ray Victory. Victory I did work with Ray Victory, Ray Victory. I was going to say to you are, are you Ray like Victory. your all the names are Ray white. Mercer They're somebody all else white guys Why he's a boxer Sean huh? Michaels Ray or, Mercer yeah Ray Victory yeah he's good yeah he's a nice yeah. guy yeah F M Bradley I worked with them together oh and really? it, yeah I worked with them together Ray Victory and F M Bradley together they're cool yeah they were cool Billy D Loved Billy D. Yeah. We were party buddies. Oh, shit, right? Billy D, we used to shoot some amazing scenes. He was a great, great performer. Really? Wow, yeah. he was awesome. No shit. Really, really good guy. I love Billy D. As a matter of fact, he sent me a message not too long ago. Oh, yeah, I'd like to interview him. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you get a hold of him. You know what? I will. I just got to look up where I saw his messages okay. coming in. I think it's on Facebook. Oh, thanks. Shawn Michaels. Love Shawn. One of my best people. Both professionally and personally, just a good guy and a friend. Always. Yeah. He's cool. always been good. Good guy. What male talent wouldn't you work with back in the day? I don't know. Nobody? If there was anybody I wouldn't have, I worked with Ron Jeremy. We had to <laughs> shave his back. Me and Cheryl Burkoff, who's now Rob Lowe's wife, could tell you this story that we put him in a bathtub and we shaved his back so I would work with him on <laughs> Best Little Whorehouse in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. It's true. You know it. You know it. <laughs> you said before you thought that um, Seika was hot, right? And um, who wasn't hot that you thought you know wasn't hot in the day? Anybody come to your, come to your mind that was kind of popular? I don't remember anybody. I wouldn't have worked with them. Okay. But I, I'm not one that would talk that, shit. That yeah. would talk shit about okay. somebody. Did you ever beat any girl's ass on the set? <laughs> <laughs> Get mad, you know? No, okay. No, I haven't. No. Did you travel to a lot of locations in your time as a in yes. the early days? Yes. What was the favorite place? Uh, Paris. I went to Paris. I went to Italy. I went to Canada. Yeah. Uh, how many days a month when you were really kicking ass when you're in the 80s would you work how many days a month would you work you think 15 days 15 20 days. days a lot of days a lot of days make the money because you want yeah, that money want that money how many movies did you do you think i've done over 500. 500 okay so you did a lot you love clive as a photographer he's your favorite love photographer clive. Suze Randall, yeah. Clive, Suze, yeah. Did you win a lot of awards at the awards ceremonies back in the day? Um, I received Lifetime Achievement Awards, yeah. Best sex scene? I received some awards, some awards like that, but I was mostly on the road dancing when stuff like that was going on. Okay. Do you like giant dicks? What's your perfect dick size? If I'm working, uh, probably on the bigger, yeah. At home? I don't know. It depends on the person. You know what I mean? Yeah. Chemistry? It's more about the person. But you don't want a small dick, though, do no, you? you? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> do you? No, I do. Really, I do. <laughs> Every, everybody, excuse my lighting because the sun went down and this is what we're dealing with. Do you like sucking dick? Yes, oral. When's the first... When was the first time you sucked the dick? Um, I was young before I before I got in the adult industry. Before I lost my virginity, I would do oral. Oh yeah. really? Yeah, we oh. would do oral and skinky. Like, you know, full oh, yeah. How old? Probably at sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. 
Right. Yeah, that's not, I mean, this is normal right. stuff, right? I was pretty normal. Yeah, you yeah. totally seem totally normal to me. I don't yeah. hear anything or feel anything like so many stories you've heard right. from girls in this business. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we don't got time for those stories, but there's some treacherous stories out there. And your brothers, especially Buck, made sure nothing came to you. Right. I mean, it was, um, I know, and I can feel it, it must have been really, really hard, you know, dealing with both parents being lost. That must have been a heartache. It, it, it yeah. Heart. It is. And I think it would be for anybody. Yeah. But I think that we don't realize the effect that stuff like that has on us when we're young until we get older and we're trying to navigate through life. The biggest thing that it has an effect on is, and I know that you probably can say this too, is once we go out into the world as civilians and we've been famous, known porn stars, it's very difficult to navigate in our interpersonal relationships with our, you know, our significant others because either they are jealous or they, you know, they're like intimidated or they're, you know, whatever. So you go through a lot of stuff. And I'm like, hey, done. I did this. I liked it. So what? Done. Mm -hmm. You know, but, and I'm not one of those people that will say, oh, I, you know, it's all behind me now. And I, you know, yeah. I hate it because you don't like it. I represent porn. Right. Via porno. <laughs> Via <laughs> porno, excuse me. Do uh, you like your pussy being licked? Yes. You come by getting your pussy licked? Yes. Okay. Do you um, swallow? Do yes. you like to swallow? Yes. What's the first time you swallowed? God. I knew you were going to say, when's the first time? <laughs> I uh, don't remember. Okay, no problem. If a man was dating you, how would he get you off? Cuddle fucking. My favorite thing. Holy oh, shit, right? I like to cuddle fuck. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, you need some love. You like, it, you're a lover. It, yeah, I'm a lover, and I'm not, like, I don't need the big show at home. Unless, of course, it's, like, that night to, like, do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but otherwise, I'm just, like, all good. Well, I think, you know, when you lose people that are important to you, maybe you want love and feel love a little more than you the other people when they're so spoiled with all the love. You know yeah. What I mean? Seems kind of like a automatic response. You want something that you don't never had or didn't have that much of. Right. You know what I mean? Anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. So, um, do you have any sexual fantasies that you haven't done? You could share. You know, I don't. <laughs> you did it all. I, whatever it is that I had not already worked out either in my personal life and being very free or in the movies. I get to often do in my chat sessions okay. because that's all talking about sex. Uh -huh. So uh, I've learned a lot because a lot of people bring things to me in these chat rooms that I've never even heard of, you know, and like fetishes and certain things. And I'm like, wow, that would make for a great porno movie. Oh, sure. I wish I would have thought of that. You know what I mean? So I still am very active. And I have my OnlyFans and I have all my stuff going on. I'll tell you about your OnlyFans because I want to make sure you get your plug okay. here. Amber Lynn on OnlyFans? I am legendary Amber Lynn on OnlyFans dot com forward slash legendary amber lynn my website is amber lynn triple x dot com my twitter is uh at triple x amber lens it's got an s on it and um, my show is rock and sexy uncensored everybody watch that yeah watch all of it yeah. and support her and check her sexiness out. Yeah, and I've got offense. I've got new projects coming out. I'm doing some work um, in the new year. I've got a SAG after a mainstream movie that I'm going to be um, that I'm going to be shooting, and that's coming up. We're still on strike with SAG, but I've got that. So I've got some good projects, some really sound projects going on. Okay, okay, sounds good. Let me ask you this question. What's the most time you've came in one outing or one day? You know, a day of fucking. 
Because you said you can multiple. Multi- I would times. say five times. Five? Yeah. In the whole day? Yeah, I probably. Okay. I would need a sandwich. You should have talked to me. After that, I would need a sandwich. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you like quickies or longies? Quickies or longies? Longies. Longies? Yeah. Okay. So what's a longie? Hour, two hours, three hours? Yeah. Okay. So 10 minutes, quickie? Whatever is like, I don't. I guess I don't limit, like if it's good, sometimes you want to just do a quick thing and be like, okay, I'm done. Yeah. I got it. I needed that. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And then other times you're like, I need to stay in bed all day today and like fuck. eat and fog and you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, you know, on the weekends you do uh-huh. that sometimes and it's all good. Yeah. Well, I love it all. So <laughs> myself, <laughs> but um, have you done a DP before? Yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah, I did DP. You work for Evasive Angles, I right. heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How was that experience? It was great. Yeah. yeah, I worked with Charlie Mack. And then I did another one. What was the other guy's name? I couldn't think of his name. He was I mean, young. I don't know. It was another one. What's I don't his know. Name? I can't remember his name. He was a young guy. I don't know. <laughs> we had a lot of actors run through. But Evasive Angles is a good company. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the 80s, right? When did you stop working and why? Um, I've never stopped working and I have never retired. Okay. okay. I not when you have the level of fame that I have or we as people have, I'm, I'm not a day player anymore because once you've made 500 movies, you don't have to be, I mean, you can, they rebox scenes. You can keep yourself going and out there. One of the reasons why I would be reluctant to participate with certain um, genres today is that the industry has gotten really out of control. I mean, some of the shit they shoot today, like donkey punching and shit like that, where they think it's okay to punch women in the face or punch them in the back of the head while they're fucking them. It's like, I mean, we used to shoot some crazy shit and people would talk shit about us. They go, how can you shoot that? But to do something like that, there's no way. And I, I still want to have sex for the enjoyment of having sex and the orgasm and getting off. If you feel like you're either a victim of a crime or witnessing a crime <laughs> you, it's not sexual to me anymore and I don't want that I, I don't see any value in that stuff so let me ask you this question Jenna you know uh-huh. Jameson and right. Jay used to come to my house you know after a couple once or twice after Jenna did one of her uh, weeks stripping you know what I mean on the road featuring and she would have so much cash sometimes she would leave the ones and fives in the dresser or in the nightstand, come back, get them later, but it was just so much. How was that for you when you were stripping out there? The money was insane? The money was absolutely insane. I was making twenty-five to $30,000 a week dancing, um, and I was carrying my money, off, my tip money off of stages and trash bags that I had to have two assistants literally come and See. pull the shit down for me and you know and the polaroid lines and all of that and i was just it and i was working every week every week so every you, week every week every week because you want and money I was on and i was making the money and making the money and you know and just it was a long thing and when we started this whole feature dance touring it wasn't touring there was a handful of girls that had made some appearances the whole feature dance touring thing was started with me and Humberto Varela the owner of Mints in Niagara Falls and he had hired Seika and he had hired um, a few of the girls, but we turned it into like touring, like a, like a like a band, and I would go on the road and be out there for like three months at a time, and that was incorporated through the Canadian strippers. That's how they would do it, you know. But they weren't porn stars, so we kind of put the two things together and then created this massive enterprise. So it was beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah, it was great. 
And then um, why I stopped dancing was I was on stage in Florida and somebody flicked ice on the stage as I was entering the stage during a Super Bowl show where the place was packed to capacity. They came in my dressing room and said, we're at capacity, the fire marshal's here, we have just enough time to get you on stage right now. And I was like sitting on the floor with rollers in my hair an hour before my show, and I just whipped the rollers out, threw on this big net dress, and went, they ran me out to the stage because they were, again, going to allow them to, to stay at capacity until, you know, the show was over. And so they were holding off the fire marshal, and I stepped up onto the stage, and somebody had thrown ice on it, and I stepped on the ice and flipped up in the air, landed on my hip blew out three discs in my back. Whoa, I have three really? herniated discs in my back. That's so, fucked up. That's yeah, bad. and they had to fly me home in a fucking wheelchair, and the doctor said to me, look, man, you either need to have back surgery and fusion. And Terry Weigel and I were on the road doing a duo show at the same time, and um, I watched Terry go into a car accident and had to have back surgery, and Terry Weigel could the? not walk normally ever what again. What the fuck, really? And she was on all these painkillers, and I said, you know oh. what, if I do that, I'm gonna be back on the pain train. I'm gonna be back on drugs. And oh. it, I fought too fucking hard to get clean. Oh. This took me too long, and I'm not going back. And so I gave it up, I walked away. from feature dancing. Well, it sucks, man, but the, the money was sick. And then you had to find something else. But they are not doing it today. Uh, it was already completely you blown know, saturated. Out. Did you save a lot of money? Saved my money. Uh, cool. That's, it was beautiful. You got, we all got a little bit of something perfect at the right time. You know what I mean? We got a little bit of something perfect at the <coughs> right time, We and we all paid our dues for it. Well, I paid my dues. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Can you... Let me ask you this question. So uh, you kind of s- elaborated on it a little bit a second ago, but not really because you're not really part of so much right now. But I know you worked a lot in the 80s, and you came back, or remo- well, not come back, but started working extra around the 2000s, right? I did. I've done um, films and shoots in all decades. All decades? All decades of the business. And I shot, it's different types of, genres they don't shoot movies anymore they shoot scenes and I always have my content where I'm you know I've got my website I've got my only fans I've got my many vids I've got you know all kinds of stuff out there so you know it's not the same thing would you think that the 80s was the shit Compared to I the other the decades? I think the 90s. The 80s was really, really great, but the 90s was good, too. And the 2000s were great. Everybody had something different to offer in a different era. I think the 90s was a great time, too. Really? Yeah, huh? I made Baywatch in the 90s. That's, that's... I, nobody paid me $20,000 for <laughs> yeah. a scene in the uh... 80s. In the 90s, I got that. I got another... Uh, uh, Close to the same amount to shoot Where the Boys Aren't Six with Vivid. Oh, yeah? PT? Yeah, went, no, it wasn't PT. It was uh, um, Ernest. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ernest nice guy. Green. Uh, yeah. Nee Harley's guy or something? Ernest guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I was mostly the 90s guy. No, I started in the 80s. 90s was my yeah. time for, as an actor. Yeah. Thousands I think, was my... I think I did better in the 90s and I made more money. Yeah? Because okay. I was Stripping. more established. Yeah, so the money is fun. Yeah. We can't deny that. Did you like money? I like money, yeah. too. I, I mean, I'm not here. I, you know, I like <laughs> the sex, but yeah. bring me the paper. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I was at the top of my game as an actor, and they said, why don't you produce? And then I started serving, so I faded away. Nobody really knew. A lot of people didn't know that I just was, you know, focusing on the other stuff because of money. You know what right. I mean? So I left. But I was a top actor at that point in time. I just slowly faded away. But um, because I liked money, you know, I started distributing. You know what I mean? Is, is there Producing. a reason why you don't work in mainstream films? Because you know, uh, most of us all find we have a lot of popularity. Um, uh, I mean, I would love to do a, a mainstream film. You know what I mean? As as an actor, yeah, it'd be wonderful. So, I don't think anybody really 
uh, looked at me as some great thespian actor, so I never thought about that. But I have a character. I don't look. know if you've seen the acting that goes on on uh, sitcoms today, but believe me, every time I've ever walked on a set, they have been. <laughs> really happy with my ability mm -hmm. to act. One of the things that we learn to do in the adult industry is that we have to be very spontaneous actors. Mm -hmm. Hit our marks, hit, deliver our lines, and fuck at the same time. Yeah. Most actors cannot do that. Yeah, we know they can't. And we had to learn our scripts. I mean, I would have memorized a 30-page script, 40-page script in like an hour and a half. Right. You know, quick. Exactly. Al was good too. I remember yeah. the script. But even the guys that are supposed to be good actors, that took them a long time to memorize the script. But anyways, I mean, you know, of course I love movies. So right. anybody wants to put me in a movie, call me up, hit me up. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> but um, did you ever get married? I did not. I've been engaged. Okay. Any regrets? Nope. Okay. Do you do you have? You know, it's kind of that same question, but not really. Do you have any regrets? What would you change if you could go back in history? Nothing. Oh. I, there, I don't have the ability to do that, and I don't live there. You know, mm -hmm. everything I've ever done, I've accepted, and uh, whether I liked it or not, I either benefited from it or I learned from it. Okay. And that's good with me. I feel that way a little bit, but sometimes you wish... Maybe you could have done this or said something a little bit extra to somebody you liked. But time's gone, you know what I mean? Yeah. But um, <clears throat> in your heyday, which was, in my belief, is the 80s, you know, as a porn star, you know what I mean? Right. I'm guessing that a lot of celebrities were watching pornos, right? And they said, this is a hot, sexy girl. She <laughs> wants to fuck. She's hot. God, I like to fuck her. Or, you know what I mean? Or if I see her, how do I meet her? Or how do I meet her through a friend or this and that? So how many celebrities did you, did you meet that wanted to meet you or have sex with you or hang out with you? Whatever, you know what I mean? A lot of, any, anybody that's well known that we... <laughs> you know? I don't kiss and tell. I mm -hmm. respect people's privacy, especially after the fact because mm -hmm. people's lives move on. Um, but I've definitely had my fair share of people. Many. Yeah, my, actors. Whoever, whoever I ever wanted. Act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. So I, yeah, you're hanging out in the clubs, and especially the Rainbow's got a lot of people coming in, right? Kind of like that kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Right. You just hey, what's up? What's up? Well, it's, it's on, right? Okay, but nothing you can talk about. All right. You're a nice person, so. What athlete, movie star, singer, boxer, UFC fighter, or famous person would you? You said you fucked whoever you wanted, right? So how about today? Which person would you, you think is good you might want to try out? Oh, my God. That's an interesting question. I don't know. Who do I like? I don't know. Nobody? Not right how now. How about Chris Hemsworth? Who's Th that? Thor. Thor? Yeah. Seems like okay. a cool guy. Yeah. yeah, seems like a cool guy. You pick somebody out for me. Well, I like girls. I like girls, you know what I mean? But, you know, and you like boys. So you know, I mean, but who you think would be good? Well, I like to see you have sex with Charles Bronson back in the day. Yeah, he was a good guy, right? Right, he was yeah. a rough, tough Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood. You know, those are the guys I like, right? So I like to... You down for those guys? I did Dolph Lundgren when he was hot. All right! Now he again. was hot when uh, I... When I yeah. The 80s? Yeah. It was, oh, in hey, the, he was, a it was in, uh, probably buff. in the 90s. It was yeah. w when he was famous for doing Rocky. In the 80s, yeah. yeah. He, was, he was, seemed he, cool, like a cool guy. He was a cool guy. He was a really hot. Yeah? I just remember he was hot and he had a big dick. Did he? Yeah. How big? But he was that, he was portraying that dude in Rocky, uh -huh. remember? Oh, um, yeah. The yeah. Russian. Yeah, what was the guy's name? Um, it was, fuck, yeah. Darth or something. Drago. 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 I've been, I've been Drago. I've been right? Drago. Yeah, and it was, was very popular then. Yeah. And well, he, he was good looking in person. Too. He seemed like like a real movie star. No, I mean, you know, I mean, he yeah, was, I but mean, I mean, he had that look. You poor know guy, I mean? he'd probably be pissed if he heard his talking show. No, he's a real. No, we're saying good things about. Yeah. About you know Dolph. Yeah. He's a cool guy. I always. He was a good. I always guy. thought he was cool. So he was good in bed. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Big I dick know. though. So that's. Yeah. One up for him. Big dick, strong. So yeah. Well, I think he's about six foot eight. 
He's about six foot eight. But there's been, oh, I'm not going to go into okay. it. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay. So, what is your favorite song of all songs made? And then that song doesn't mean the favorite singer, but who's also your favorite singer? My favorite song probably would be um, Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. Beautiful. Okay, yeah, love that song. I was a big Zeppelin fan as a kid. Um, and then what? What's the last? The Who's his favorite singer? Robert Plant? Yeah. Yeah? When I was a kid, it was Steven Tyler. But uh -huh. Robert Plant would probably be today. Okay. What's your favorite movie? Top Gun. Yeah? Original? Or An Officer and a Gentleman. Okay. Yeah. You like Tom Cruise? Richard Gere? I like the movie. Okay. Where's your favorite holiday retreat? Home. Really? I like to be home. All right. What does Amber Lynn do for fun today? Uh, work out, play with my dog, go to the dog park, run, um, shop, anything I want. Okay. What would you do if you had the power to make the world better today? I would give people the ability to be able to um, disagree without attacking each other and find a way to coexist in war, without war. Without war. I would forbid all war. Yeah, it's, it seems senseless in today that people go to war. We're it's past like we that. don't have a better way to communicate our disagreements without <clears throat> blowing each other up and killing each other's kids. Right, we're past that. I mean, we should be. But we should we're be not. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Look what's happening, and right. we have to we have to side up with people and do this kind of crap. But both sides don't want nothing to do with this. And all sides don't want anything to do with it. Only one person wants the people who make money. Yeah, it's it's bad, but I don't believe that the U.S. should be funding this shit. I'll tell you that <laughs> because don't we don't have the money. No, we don't. Right. How would you describe your experience in the biz in two words? All good. All good. And that is our show for today, folks. We are done. Thanks for. Tune in to TT Boy TV. Thank you, Amberlynn, so much for coming. I've been trying to get her here for a little while, right? So I got her, and I'm happy. And it was a beautiful interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for and, having me. And I hope you had a good time. I did. I did. Appreciate it. Peace out. Bye. Good sex, good life, <laughs> and a lot of cash. Oh. TT Boy TV out. <laughs>